We're going to get started in one minute. In accordance with the meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You're excused, Walter. Welcome, everyone. There's plenty of seats, so why don't you uh, come on right up front. There's plenty here at the table. Okay. Before we get started, I wanted to just take a moment to uh, recognize our town administrator and congratulate him and his wife and his family on the birth of their third child, uh, Luke. Um, what was the date he was born, Michael? Uh, Wednesday, April 11th. Wednesday, yeah, April 11th. Well, congratulations. Uh, on behalf of the board, Michael, I'd like to make a small presentation. It's, well, a, it's a bottle for Luke. <laughs> 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 yeah, he took a drink out of it. Before we do, I'd like to just take a moment of silence tonight for the victims in Toronto and that horrific act that happened today. So if we could just maybe take a moment of silence and think of their families and keep them in our prayers for a moment. Thank you. Okay. We're going to start with the minutes. Can I can I just ask for the for the um, the regular session minutes that we pass over those? I don't mean to interrupt you, Mr. Chairman, but I think there's a couple of things that were in there that might I think need just need a little bit more detail on them. So that's the um, April second um, regular minutes. The executives are fine. Yeah. Yes. So we'll just do the executive. We'll come back to the April 2nd. Uh, Mr. Meeting. Chairman, I move to approve the April 2, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, folks, come on in. There's plenty of seats right up front. And I'd like to take the moment now to open up for public comment. If anyone's here for public comment, uh, just raise your hand. Oh, I'm going to ask for your name and your street. And I recognize. Yes, sir. You can use the microphone right in front of you if you don't mind. Uh, Mr. First, I'm deaf in one ear and I can hardly hear on your speak. I'm going to try to talk as loud as I can for you. I apologize. You'll be my interpreter. If you want to read. Uh, Walter is here tonight to uh, clear up an unfortunate uh, use of words that were written in the transcript and he would like to uh, apologize uh, to the selectmen uh, for the words that he used were inappropriate and uh, it was not meant in malice uh, I, I think in his his thinking uh, Uh, he used uh, words that were not appropriate and for that uh, he is sorry and uh, he would like to apologize to the board and to any members that were offended and hopefully uh, they will accept his apology and make them lay the matter to rest well thank you mr. Fitzmorris for coming in this evening and uh, making that public apologies I accept your apology um, the others can speak for themselves. But I personally don't really think you did anything wrong. I think you have a right to state whatever position or p opinion you may have. I think, yes, you maybe went a little overboard when you claimed that we uh, did something illegal. 
but um, you know you have a right to speak freely and submit whatever you like to the transcript and but my issue is with the transcript and I think they have an obligation to the community and to this board that you know if somebody's going to make an accusation that we're doing something illegal they should we should at least have some facts before it's published and you know I took some offense to that and it hurt it hurt me it hurt my family um, you know I put a lot of time here in town and we deserve a little more credit than someone making a claim that we're doing something illegal if we are I certainly would hope that the information would be presented so people can make an opinion but to just say it and without the transcript at least making an acknowledgement that they didn't have um, any proof that this was true hit, to me is more hurtful than anything you had said but I appreciate the opportunity of coming here this evening in front of us and personally apologizing and I accept your apology thank you uh, any boat? Yes. And I also think um, s your facts are inaccurate. So I disagree with what was written. Um, again, accept your apology, but disagree that, you know, p we're in an age where we can just spout false facts or false accusations, and they're out there so people believe them, whether they're disavowed or not. I didn't hear any disavowing of the facts that were printed there. I think that we're in a place where false facts become news unfortunately and obviously the transcript may have benefited by people reading it or looking at it because of what was published and I too hold the transcript accountable for that and I take a bit of umbrage at ch people challenging volunteers we're a community of volunteers just because we're elected officials doesn't mean anyone can take shots at us because we're elected volunteers just like we don't challenge a cheerleading volunteer for his or her commitment or a track coach volunteer for his or her commitment or the cable television committee volunteers we don't challenge them for their commitment what do we gain by this service the same thing that every other volunteer in this town gains which is a sense of community that we're trying to form here by volunteering so if anyone's challenging the multitude of volunteers that participate in our community, stand up and volunteer or step aside and let the rest of us do that civic service. Everyone should volunteer, but I don't think that that opens us up to being uh, challenged for our volunteerism or opens up us up to be um, you know, called criminals or allegations of criminal conduct. It also shows I don't think you're watching the meetings because the facts that were printed in there are, are completely inaccurate. I understand in this case that there's a minimal likelihood that, that uh, the, what was printed will be given credence. Nonetheless, I do hold the transcript account accountable for it. So again, I think that this is a community that has volunteers all over the place. Everyone volunteers. There's people that volunteer in many different ways. And they teach religious education. They coach. They go to, they open their office up to put 300 Easter baskets together. Hundreds of volunteers in this community. And people shouldn't be challenged for the service that they bring to make this a community. That's what we get out of this. And, and I think that you should know and get to know the people that are volunteering here. Because they're, they're everywhere. And that's just my piece on it. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, Mr. Fitzmaurice, um, you're here apologizing. I guess that's good. You don't get an award from me for being here because you should be here apologizing. Um, did you realize that this affects families when you make allegations like that? My wife was stopped by parents after church yesterday saying, I hope your kids aren't teased at school at this because of this. I hope that means something to you. I hope everyone in this room is touched by that statement. I was. I, you know, life is too short to be bitter. I'm going to turn the other cheek on this. Um, when we sign up for public service, we sign up to be criticized on the issues. That's fair game. We don't sign up to be accused of a crime. And Mr. Fismaris, Fis I ask you, when you go to vote in our town elections in May and you see not one contested race on the ballot, Look at your letter, and I think you're going to know why there's nobody running for these offices. No one wants to run so they can be libeled. That's all I have to say. Anyone else? Okay. I've been on the board almost 14 years, and uh, 
board members don't always agree with one another, but I know one thing for sure. They all, their opinions and where they go are always in the best interest of the community. And sometimes uh, those discussions get raveled in the news and other, other media, and uh, as a result, they aren't necessarily the fact. I'll make one comment related to the water, which this is focused on, although Steve and I were charged with the responsibility of moving the project. The entire board has been involved, and our chairman specifically has been an advocate for getting this done and getting it done right in the best interest of the community. And. Uh, I think uh, that's what's important. I also accept your apology. Thank you. I think, uh, let me think. I first ran for office about 45 or 46 years ago. And uh, I've 10 been years old. In, uh, about 10 <laughs> years old, yeah. And, wow. and, and I've seen my name, uh, you know, of course, in the newspaper and the letters to the editor over the years and haven't necessarily uh, uh, considered it fair, but, you know, I consider it fair game too. You know, um, and it is unfortunate. And again, I, I participated in, uh, you know, elected public office, uh, volunteering on different boards, committees, and commissions, uh, coaching uh, Little League soccer, and uh, being criticized for, you know, playing one kid more than another or whatever it is. And, uh, but I knew that getting into the, getting into the game too. And maybe I've developed a thick skin. Uh, and, and I too have been accused of uh, uh, substantial wrongdoing that bordering on criminal, bordering on criminal activity. And my kids were subject to it too, and um, and yeah, it, it does it does happen. It does occur, and uh, that's why, um, again, when we volunteer here, it does impact our families and our community as a whole, and the impression that people have of us. You know, I would just uh, first of all suggest to my colleagues here, uh, that's sort of what you buy into, and it's not fair, it's not necessarily right, uh, but it's part of the part of the game and the, and the family uh, does suffer as a result of, of our choices that we've made and fortunately you know we've been very our families have been very supportive and uh, my kids for the most part I guess have been able to weather the storm over the years and I've certainly given people plenty of opportunity to be critical of me. Um, nonetheless uh, in relation to the specific issue as Mr. Masseri pointed out which is the water issue and MWRA versus Andover um, this board collectively has been working very hard to make a decision which is going to impact this community for decades to come. And nobody has taken it lightly and everybody has been an active participant and uh, we've had a good, honest uh, discussion in relation to which direction to take and we're on the cusp of making that decision now. And again, it's going to impact our community for, for years to come. And I can tell you right now, unequivocally, I have never questioned anybody's motives or intentions on this board in relation to uh, the position they've taken, their thought process, um, the issues that they've raised, one way or the other. It's been a good, thoughtful, thorough discussion uh, that's taken place, and uh, it's serious, and we, everybody has taken it seriously here. So uh, I've been in your crosshairs before, along with most anybody in the last 60 years. You know, uh, Walter, you've never minced your words. Uh, and again, I may not have agreed with your words over the years, um, and again, uh, when I see you in the coffee shop, many times I have thanked you for not including me in your letters to the editor. Uh, but that being said, you know, words do matter. Impressions that are left do matter. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate uh, that people, you know, take it to heart um, as such. And, and again, just, you know, going forward, I hope to still hear from you. You know, I still hope to still, you know, see your letters to the editor. You know, just choose your words a little more carefully and less accusatory. Again, question us on our positions, but not necessarily our, our positions and the rationale behind it. Because I've served with these people for a number of years now. I've served with a lot of people over the years. And I can't think of anybody whose motives and intentions I truly do question it ever. So, you know, just, you know, from that perspective, you know, for the transcript standpoint, you know, do they have a responsibility to, to edit somebody's, Letter to the editor. I'm not overly concerned about it personally myself. As I said, I've been on the crosshairs before. Uh, they have a right to uh, allow people to voice their opinions, question their public officials. Um, you know, with that comes some consternation. 
Uh, I, I personally am okay with it. Um, but uh, you know, that being said, please don't question anybody's motives or intentions here in this particular issue. And I can't think of any other issue that's before us today. Uh, it's unnecessary and unwarranted. Everybody's here for the right reason, thinking it through, working through the issues. And uh, I appreciate you coming and uh, publicly stating you know, what you did um, and recognizing the sensitivity uh, of the issue. And uh, to me, I applaud you. And again, I applaud you for your prior service to the community and to the country too. So thank you very much. Well, I just, I wanna end it with, with this one thing and then we'll get to the next person is, you, you, you are both honored. I uh, should have a, a lot of data, great, uh, a lot of gratitude from all of us because you did put a lot of work in. They did and they deserve that from you. But it was a team effort. It was a complete board effort on that. And in the regards to the transcript, Steve, I think it's, they, they owe us the apology because you know, under the old leadership, if there was something stated that if there was somebody making an accusation, at least there should be some kind of a comment that says that was it not, there was no evidence provided to prove that it's actually true. I think they have that responsibility because anybody, because at that point we weaponized the transcript. They can go out and say whatever they want about anybody with any kind of accusation yeah. and that's not right. And I think that needs to be fixed. And I think the transcript should be in here making the apology. That's what I believe. So anybody else have an open, any, Mr. Delaney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board, Sean Delaney, 7 Dix Road. Uh, I'm here to speak about this topic. I think I speak from a unique position, having had the pleasure and the opportunity of having sat where you sit uh, for a couple of terms. And uh, Mr. O'Leary is right. You know, when you step forward and you're fortunate, fortunate enough to be elected by this community, there are some things you have to accept. And that's fine when folks disagree with your opinion on issues and how you vote and how you come down. But however, it crosses the line when someone makes an allegation uh, that is criminal in nature. Kickbacks and blackmail, that's criminal. And that's where Mr. Fitzmaurice crossed the line. I'm very happy to see that he came tonight and apologized for that. But the transcript's out there to thousands of people. It's out there. And those of us that know Mr. Fitzmaurice, I've known him for about 10 years. And when I first read it, I said, that's Walter. Sort of like Manny Ramirez when he was with the Red Sox, that's Manny being Manny. Unfortunately, in this community, it's not widespread as to who Walter Fitzmaurice is. So, you know, the transcript is widespread. It's what those people out there are reading it, thinking about the three board members that he accused. That's what it was. It was an accusation. And I know, and look, no one asked me to be here tonight. Truth be told, to be upfront and honest, Mr. Prisco is a very good friend of mine. Mr. Prisco is probably the most successful businessman that I personally know. And I know that he and his family has contributed more than just his seven, eight years on this board. He has contributed a financial sum that I can't even put a dollar figure on it anymore to this community. Him and his wife have done so. He's a gentleman who will give you the shirt off his back. When someone makes an accusation, it could, such as this, it could affect your business relationships going forward. Mr. Schultz is a friend of mine. I share office space with him. And he too is a man of utmost integrity. I've known him for about five or six years. Miss Manapelli, I've known her since she sat on this board now for the, her third year. Right? Everyone has families. And there's certain things as board members you have to accept. In addition to that, Mr. Schultz and Miss Manapelli are attorneys, as am I. I know what it takes to get to that point in your life. Mr. Schultz has a very successful law practice. Ms. Manapelli does, and she's also employed, my understanding is, by the city of Malden. Mm -hmm. We as lawyers, we have a board of bar overseers that we have to report to. That's not, that's just, that's just not, they don't look at what we do just in a practice of law. 
They look to do, they look at what we do in our private life. They look to do, they look at what we do in our public service life. These could have, these, this one, one sentence could have wide ranging effects, particularly on these two attorneys who are here. And again, volunteering their time, like any, any member in this community who is an elected official or a volunteer on any board or committee. Volunteers, and I would say that that's an exception, that's not the rule. Most elected officials in other communities, whether a town or a city, get paid something to step up and do what they do. These folks, all five of these members have stepped up, Mr. O'Leary, for decades upon decades, Mr. Mosseri for a couple of decades, but everyone has stepped up to give back to their community in their own certain way. Let me just read what it is to be liable. A method of defamation, defamation expressed by print, writing, pictures, or signs. In its most general sense, any publication that is in, injurious to the reputation of another, a false and unprivileged publication in writing of defamatory material. A maliciously written or printed publication which tends to blacken, blacken a person's reputation or to expose him to public hatred, contempt, or ridicule. Or to injure him in his business or profession. That's the definition of liable by Black's Law Dictionary. That is what this letter to the editor could have as an effect on the three people it was meant to address, in three members of this board that were accused. And I would submit, although it only addressed three members, I think this is an accusation against the body as a whole. And I was glad to see that both Mr. Massieri and Mr. O'Leary addressed Mr. Fitzmaurice and coming to support of the three members who were accused of this activity. In terms of the transcript, I think this is where it gets a little dicey. It's my understanding, and I know Ms. Dari's here, and I know she's a fairly new editor of the transcript, and I know she's dedicated, uh, I think, her entire professional career with the transcript, our local newspaper. I know she had to go over to Linfield for a period of time when they moved her over there. She's done tremendous work. But it's my understanding that the original letter to Mr. Fit, from Mr. Fitzmaurice to the transcript actually misidentified one member of this board. And it's my understanding the transcript had edited it. So in terms of editing, I believe it's my understanding, and Ms. Dari can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they actually took steps to edit it. I don't think they went far enough. I do agree with what Mr. Prisco said, that the prior ownership and the prior editor, one prior to the one before Ms. Dari, at least would have put an editorial's comment under that letter to the editor that would have corrected or attempt corrected it to the public who was reading that letter last Thursday when they received their transcript. And we probably wouldn't be here tonight if that was done. Gentlemen, lady, thank you for your time. Do have anyone else for public comment? Please come to the podium, state your name in your street. Yeah, Eric Evans, 3 Sandra Lane. Uh, just a brief restatement of our um, position on the sidewalk bylaw. Go right ahead. Yeah. Brief, I said so. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Egan. I'm the executive director of the Ready North Reading Chamber of Commerce. We're here to talk about an issue that everyone is very excited to discuss, and that's <laughs> snow removal. <laughs> Hugh, Hugh Humer, sorry, I'm trying to lighten the mood. I know this is a lot of important issues. Um, but we have been working as a committee um, along with business owners and chamber members about the snow bylaw. I realize there's other important things, very important things that you have to talk about tonight. But I've been working with Eric, Pat Lee, and a lot of other members in the community, both within the chamber and without, on this important issue. It's something that Mike Gilberto and I have talked about regularly over the years and I know it's a challenging topic. We were tasked with trying to come up with a solution that worked for both the businesses and the town, and we've been meeting diligently about four or five times and spent a lot of hours on this. We put forth and engaged a local attorney to uh, repeal the bylaw, and I know things have changed a little bit. Um, 
in recent discussions in terms of what is happening, but I know that the snow removal is a challenge. I know Mike Gilberto had reached out to me, I think on four different occasions this very winter alone to remind people about the bylaw, which I think tells me that what we have right now isn't effective and it isn't working. I know no one wants to think about the snow because it's finally finally melted, but I wanted to um, let the board know that we are we did work very hard on it and we'd like to continue that progress um, within the chamber and with all, for all the businesses. I know that when I see people darting out onto 28, Within the snow, it, it, it you know it's a white knuckle situation. It's dangerous. We don't have contiguous sidewalks, which makes an, addi an additional challenge. So I respectfully want to you know request that we continue to talk about it because unfortunately winter will will be here again. Thank you. So let me just tell you real quick because we had a meeting this afternoon with a few um, department internally, and so what we're going to do is. This is coming up for a public hearing for our Tom Warren articles, I believe, in a few weeks. And Mr. Schultz has been our identified liaison to work with the business community to continue to have this discussion on this. And my recommendation is going to be to the board is that we pass over this Warren article because we're hopeful we're not going to have any more snow between now and October <laughs> and give you this opportunity to work with Andrew in our town departments on a solution I and mean, we met with the chief today too and I think he has some really good ideas you know, so we'd like to have one member of the chamber one member from the business community mr. Schultz along with our department uh, members and between now and October before October town meeting really come up with uh, an op um, an option you know or, or at least a um, consideration of change to the our existing bylaw but I don't want to go to town meeting and repeal it now because there's, there's no value in doing that we have now until October and I think we can get a lot done between now and then so I, I could ask you to just be patient as soon as this meeting's over mr. Schultz is going to follow up with you to start scheduling these regular subcommittee uh, meetings to really come up with a resolution okay so we and what we're going to do is we're going to identify the problem and then we're going to come up with a, a solution that we can all live with that we're all equally unhappy with I think it's probably the best way to put it okay Okay, thank you. So let me get my, my two cents in. So I've been, you know, having the joy of coordinating the, the meetings and putting a lot of time and effort into this issue. And we had come to a uh, decision to come up with a citizen's petition to um, address the issue and get the bylaw repealed. And we were, as we consulted members of the board, we were told that, oh no, we're gonna, the board's gonna put it on the warrant. Um, you know, so and we, we missed that March night. If we we're gonna do a citizen's petition, we missed that March 19th cutoff that we're really you know, pushing for because we were told otherwise that the, yep. the, the selectmen were going to take care of it. So we would like, you know, October, if things happen, we'd like to see an opportunity for this to be on the warrant in June, not not in October. And that's really our position. We want to push forward with this. Yep. And the last person I just want to come up is have Pat Lee come up for a minute and talk. Thank you. Hi, Pat Lee. 226 Main Street. Whoop. No, I spend more time there than I do. 22 Aspen Road. Sorry. Um, uh, you know, there's. It's it's a debate that's been going on for a while. It will continue going on until we come to a resolution. I guess my main point is I want to thank the board for having an open mind and working with the business community and the business community working with the community and the residents to create a safe sidewalk during the winter months. Um, it takes a lot of effort. It, it's truly not working as it is right now. Um, there's certainly room for improvement, and I think if the town, the business community, and the residents work together, I think we can come up with a solution. And I appreciate the uh, selectmen giving us the time, Mr. Schultz spending so much of his personal time working with us in the business community to try to help come up with a solution to this. Um, it's not going to happen with just the business community. It's not going to happen just with the town coming up with a position. We're going to have to work together on this. And I do want to thank you again for your open-mindedness and your efforts up to this point in time to come up with this solution. And uh, hopefully it's something we can do in the near future, be it June or October, um, to come to a resolution on this so we have safe sidewalks for the town. We agree. No, okay. I think I speak for everybody on the board. We fully agree with you. But I just don't see it being done between now and June. I, I really don't. Okay. Um, and I would just ask you to be patient. And I, and I met with the chief today. 
the acting DPW director and our DPW foreman and our supervisor and I think they have a lot of really good ideas and Mr. Schultz is prepared he's got all the information to put together the meetings and give please real briefly I, we, we met today like from Prisco and myself with those aforementioned people and we have a, gotten to the point where we're isolating parcels that are going to be a problem we've really gotten a lot of ways down the road of trying to help with a solution so I, I don't want you guys to think we're just giving you lip no. service here tonight we're there's serious. a lot of work that's going on behind the scenes in the town hall on this issue Thank you. Well, the uh, July and August meetings are going to be exciting, so make sure you come on down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anyone else for pub you. comment? Please. Warren, even though everybody in this room knows you, I, I need <laughs> you to just say your name, your full name <laughs> and your address. Warren, 219 Havel Street. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just want to make a comment on the on this on when Walt is in um, with the transcript thing. Um, clearly, what he did cross the line, um, and and I think that it, I'm glad the, the apology came because uh, I've, I've only done 26 years so far. I'm catching you, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> but I do want to re actually reiterate some of what Steve had to say. I mean, uh, we've, in all my years on the board, we've been threatened more than a few times to the point we've actually had to have a police officer at our meeting to maintain decorum. Uh, hasn't happened often, but a couple times. So um, um, most of the time, when, I, when, when that kind of thing happens, when somebody is that unhappy with something, it means that they don't understand it. And so as opposed to um, uh, going after the, the person or, the, or, the, or even the messenger, I think what it indicates is the fact that there needs to be a little more discussion, a little more explanation. So what, what we've done in the past on the planning board is invite that person in and ask them to sit down and say, what, you know, why are you mad? What is the question? Can we, can we answer more questions for you? Can we help you understand what it is that we're doing and why we made the decision that we made? Because, you know, and I, and, and the, on the planning board, there's a, any time you put a new subdivision in, there's plenty of people who don't want it because they only wanted the one they moved into, not the next one. So, so you, we, plenty of opportunity to deal with that kind of thing. So I just think that, that, um, um, when you hear something like this, it's not necessarily uh, as much a threat as perhaps a cry for help. You know, what, you know what? I don't understand this. And I think maybe the important thing to do in a case like this is accept the apology, but also understand there may be more people out there that don't clearly understand why the decision was made in the way it was made, and that perhaps a little more education is necessary on it. So uh, I want to make that comment to you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. Good evening. Uh, Ruth Fierro, 18 Plymouth Street. Mine is more of a personal nature than what's going on with all of this. So I'm going to be really, really, really short with this. I would like just to hand this out to you, and hopefully you can get back to me sure. and look at this, because I really don't want to take your time up tonight. It seems like a lot of people have a lot more things going on tonight. Okay. I don't know if you get one straight to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you can just look at the photo, please, and get back to me. Um, like I said, it's more of a personal nature than everything else that's going on tonight. Mm -hmm. I appreciate yep. consideration because it's really important to me. I am. I'm aware of your. Um, these are pictures. Yep. And if you Thank can you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Ms. Ferrero, we are going to take the act take this as an action item and I promise you somebody from the town administrator's office will get back with you and see either something in writing or at least a phone call and have a conversation but you are owed an answer so you can uh, count on that happening okay thank you very much yeah. no thank you for coming in mr. mr. O'Leary would like to yeah say just a uh, I've had uh, several conversations uh, with Ms. Fierro and with the town administrator in relation to uh, the issue on Plymouth Street and um, I, too, believe that uh, Ms. Fierro is uh, owed a more detailed explanation as to um, how things were handled, how it occurred, and what stage of the game it's at right now. You know, it, it involves two things. One is uh, zoning in relation to safe and adequate access, and the other is a building close to uh, wetlands. So there's planning board issue and there's conservation issues. And... Um, you know, I, I think we've somewhat addressed the, the, the planning board issues and again, may not satisfy, you know, uh, Ms. Fierro as far as uh, what the outcome of that is. Conservation issues in relation to uh, timing and ability to uh, adequately um, appeal the decisions. 
and uh, responses um, from uh, people within town hall. And uh, I believe she has owed an explanation, a more detailed explanation uh, in relation to how things were handled. And uh, it's been an ongoing discussion for several weeks. And again, I appreciate all of you and what you do for our council. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Oh, Ms. Doherty. Mrs. Doherty, please. Good evening, my name is Maureen Doherty. I'm the editor of the North Atlantic Transcript. On behalf of the newspaper, I want to apologize to Selectman Chairman Mike Prisco, Selectman Andrew Schultz, and Selectwoman Catherine Manny Pelly for statements that were printed in a letter to the editor written by Mr. Walter Fitzmorris in last week's issue of the transcript. We do not agree with Mr. Fitzmorris's allegations. We apologize to the Selectmen, all five of them, and their families and we will print a retraction in this week's edition. No malice to what any member of the Board of Selectmen was intended on our part in publishing his letter. And I believe that my coverage of the Board from the time I started in August, in particular on this issue, showed clarity of what um, everybody's positioning has been on it, and it has been fair and balanced. Um, and in response to um, Mr. Delaney's question as to why there was the, the, the clarification that was made in Mr. Fitzmaurice's letter is when Mr. Fitzmaurice came in person to the office to give me his letter and I looked at it and I saw he had used the name of Mr. Delaney who was no longer a public figure. I asked Mr. Mr. Fitzmaurice if he understood that he had made an error and that there, the, he had listed the other members of the board correctly um, and that there had been an election in the last year and Mr. Delaney in fact had not been on the board in several years and he indicated to me that he understood um, this and he um, asked me if I would insert the name of the correct selectman which happened to be Andrew Schultz in place of Mr. Delaney. Because as you know, there is a standard um, that um, is, is higher when, it, when the person is a public figure as opposed to um, stepping down and then becoming an ordinary citizen again. Um, so that, um, that was merely a, a clarification on our part. And again, absolutely no, no, no malice toward any of you guys. Yeah. Um, I'm here till midnight with you guys. I know how hard you work. Um, and I just believe it was a misunderstanding on the, the letter writer's part as to what, what he was trying to convey. Um, and I thank you for your time, and I apologize. Thank you, Ms. Authority, for making that statement. I, I, I appreciate the apology, and I just hope that we can find some lessons learned in all of this mm -hmm. so it doesn't happen again in the future. So if anybody in the community wants to be part of the public office, they can feel that they're going to at least get a fair shot, at least the transcript, but at least have a, a fair process that if somebody's going to make an accusation that it's at least tracked and that whether if, <coughs> if you cannot find any evidence of it, at least s let the public know that. And I think that's an important part of the process and I'm hoping at this point forward we won't have any more of this. People should have the right <coughs> to submit whatever they want and say whatever they want. They certainly have that right, but I also think you have a responsibility too to Make sure the facts are appropriate, which I will say, you've done an outstanding job since you've taken over in making sure the information is getting out, especially on this issue with the water. Uh, I think Mr. Masseri and Mr. O'Leary have gone above and beyond to make sure the information has been public. We've given a lot of workshops and solid presentations, and you've done a great job capturing it in all of the past transcripts. So, uh, I just think we have a bump in the road here, Maureen, and I certainly think we find room for improvement. And I appreciate it. And, and Mrs. Manupelli, please. No, and I, I also, I, I appreciate the apology. Uh, we all in this room know we're in this age where bots create content that people believe. And people publish false accusations or make false statements that people believe. And I feel that just as we don't, oh, we, we shouldn't be exposed to those kind of false accusations, or certainly criminal accusations, we need more responsible journalism. And 
I, I understand you sit here with us till very late in the evenings on a lot of this, and I agree with uh, Chairman Prisco. We have reached out and done a number of public um, commentaries on this. We, we, we haven't made a determination, a final determination yet. We have deliberated this, and there is such a significant importance to hearing differences of opinions that are founded on facts, because that helps us inform our own decision. But I also think that it, it doesn't mitigate the need for someone to come forward and disavow false facts, and it doesn't mitigate the need for the transcript to be far more responsible in terms of what it's doing with these, this kind of content. So I agree, it's unfortunate. Disavowing the incorrect information is important, just as more responsible journalism is important here. And that, that's Mr. Schultz. Say about that. Uh, I just want to state for the public, I've spoken to Ms. Doherty probably four or five times since this has happened. And, um, she has been very gracious. She realizes a mistake has been made. I accept your apology, and I want this to end as much as anybody. And um, I just want to make sure the public, I don't want this to be harming the transcript. Maureen does a great job, and I use the word gracious because she's shown nothing but graciousness towards me throughout this whole process since this story broke last week. I just want to state that publicly. Thank you. No other public comments? <coughs> One more, please. Good evening. I'm Jillian String, and just uh, for full disclosure, I am an employee of the transcript, uh, but my opinions that I am about to express in no way reflect the opinions of the transcript. I am purely speaking uh, as an individual. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to everybody for your service. Um, it's wonderful that you do volunteer your time and you clearly work very hard uh, with the interests of the town. Um, but I just uh, wanted to thank Mr. Delaney for giving us the definition of libel, but I just wanted to share that um, most recently uh, Schaefer et al. versus CBS Corporation reminds us that um, inferences are not covered under libel. So the media can't be held accountable for inferences people may make when they read an opinion statement. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Fitzmorris clearly makes an opinion statement in his letter to the editor. I'm going to correct you. He made a direct allegation, in my opinion. And I think 12 reasonable jurors in a jury box would agree well, with me. We're not, we're not here to debate We're not here to debate you. Uh, but certainly. Um, but I do believe he said, it seems to me that, which is very clearly an opinion statement. Um, so just just to clarify that point, um, and um, again, with the issue of libel, um, this letter to the editor was posted within the transcript, which would be available to the subscribers of the transcript and anyone who wanted to purchase a copy in the town. But uh, I believe, Mr. Schultz, you made it much more public by put, posting it on Facebook mm -hmm. uh, for the town to read. So I guess if you were that concerned with a libelous statement, I was wondering why maybe you made it so public. Well, I believe there's a few members of the board that have posted this, this issue on Facebook. I wasn't the first. Um, because it's wrong. When we sign up to be public officials, we sign up to be chastised, to be debated on our opinion. We don't sign up to be accused of criminality. It is a big delineation. I think you're doing yourself with this, if this whole thing is on the path of going away. You're not helping your newspaper right now. My advice would be to stop talking, sit down, let this go away. Because People are watching this at home. I don't think there's anyone in this town that defends the transcripts actions here. Those are the people that write your, that, that, that are your subscribers to pay your salaries. The businesses in town are the ones that pay for the advertising. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm merely suggesting I would stop this line because I think you're going down the wrong path and I think you really need to rethink what you just said. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Thank Lindy you very Pelly. much. I'm not sure if I, I also think that there's a, is a misapplication of the case that you're citing because we certainly are, as public officials, like my colleague said, open to criticism and open to debate and open to public debate over our positions on issues or our votes on issues. But we are not open to offensive allegations that are completely false. And we have the unusual scenario where we have a reporter sitting through our meetings 
the entire meetings, which sometimes go till very late in the evening, and we all have families to go home to, and the reporter knows the facts in this case, and we just heard the reporter, you know, edit editing the letter to the editor. My husband's a media person. I am a constitutionalist to the nth degree. I am a free speech supporter to the nth degree. I am a person who grew up in a family of politicians. I have alligator skin. I understand in this case is minimal likelihood based on the author that people are going to give it credence. It's the conduct of the transcript stepping in and making corrections and printing something that the, the editor knows is inaccurate factually and in terms of a criminal allegation. That is at issue here. And again, we want to move forward. We have a lot of business to attend to this evening. But I, I think you're misapplying that case to the circumstance because we don't open ourselves up to allegations of criminal conduct. That's, that's what I'm saying. We certainly see that over and over and over again in the news with certain politicians. And that's very concerning to us because we are held to a higher standard. We have a license to practice law. We have businesses in the community. And I'm also a municipal employee. So it's a triple whammy for us that we're business owners, on family, yep. and Which attorney. We are going to move on from this subject. But the bottom line is that at both sides, we need to take some lessons learned from this. And I think we can find improvements to make sure that we communicate better and that we don't weaponize the transcript to go after anybody in town to say whatever they want about anybody right. in town. Well, still mm -hmm. and <coughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's the r and that's the right way it should be. Absolutely. Whether it's legal or not, we're all human beings and it's the ethical thing to do. Any other open comments? Uh, public comments? No. Okay, we're going to go um, we're going to just bypass all the new business cuz we got a lot to still do. We're going to try to sign the May town election warrant and then actually you know what I'm going to skip the, the mm -hmm. signing of the town warrant and I'd like to take this opportunity now to recognize Mr. DeKohler if that's okay because I want to make sure we have enough time before the 730. Certainly uh, and I also believe Mr. Furiello is here to witness the signing oh, as well. Oh he is? Yeah. He's Let's do it then. Go ahead. So there should be a motion to sign the sign the warrant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to sign the May 8, 2018 town election warrant. Second. Second. Actually, don't. I have a motion. Take away by second. second. Since I'm on it, I'm going to vote anyway. But I'm sorry. <laughs> I said since I'm on it, I think mean. <laughs> it's legal. Okay, second. Yeah, okay. Right. Mrs. Manupelli seconded. Any discussion on the town warrant? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. While we're signing that, Mr. Gilberto, I will turn it over to you if you. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And we do have a plaque for the board to present uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're here this evening to honor uh, Jim DeCola, who is our retiring building inspector. Jim, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, as I commented at the last board meeting, uh, at our last discussion, Jim has been with the town for. Um, over 30 years, dating back to his hiring in 1988 as the assistant wire inspector. In 1992, he became the alternate building inspector. 1994, he became a full-time employee serving as a part-time wiring inspector and a part-time building inspector. In October of 2002, he became the permanent inspector of buildings, a position he's held since that point in time. Um, he holds eight certifications, including that of a building inspector, building commissioner, electrical inspector and as a master electrician as well. Um, Jim has maintained uh, an active role in not only the statewide association of uh, building officials but also in his own education, um, continuing his familiarity with the codes and uh, I know um, has uh, a deep understanding not only of the state code but of uh, the uniqueness of North Reading's local bylaws as well uh, in administering them. And I guess the comparison that I, I, I'd bring up is we talked a bit with the town engineer about the daily interaction with employees. And Mr. DeCola is a face that, uh, I'm going to hold my comments for a second as people exit the room. If we could just, the, the outside crew, if maybe we can even move people in. We have plenty of chairs in the summer up front here. And 
along the back. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you. So, Mr. DeCola is a face that many property owners here in town have seen um, in order to uh, improve their homes, um, to make simple repairs to their homes, to develop their property, um, to uh, potentially construct a subdivision, all the way up to the largest of development projects, including um, North Reading Middle High School uh, renovation and construction, the Edgewood apartment complex, and most recently the uh, Pulte Homes in New England development at 104 Lowell Road. Um, all of that construction comes through the Office of the Building Inspector. And Mr. DeCola, uh, his assistant who's here, uh, Aldous Alvo, his administrative assistant, Kathy Morgan, who's also here, uh, and also the prior administrative assistant, assistant, Michelle Mon, who I don't think is here this evening, but I know is a familiar face around Town Hall. They've all worked to uh, assist property owners uh, in the responsible development of their property. Uh, when town meeting takes action to amend our bylaw, to create a new zoning bylaw, it often comes to Mr. DeCola to implement it. Uh, and uh, he's done so uh, professionally uh, with consideration of the needs of our residents uh, for the past 30 years. And we thank him for his service. So, Mr. Chairman, through you, we have a plaque for presentation. We've asked Mr. DeCola to come forward for the presentation. And then maybe Ms. Darty, we could take a photo if that's all right. <laughs> yeah. No. Just take a moment to read the plaque, Mr. DeCola, if I could. Presented to James DeCola in recognition of his 30 years of dedicated service to the town of North Reading, including 16 years as building inspector, given by the Board of Selectmen on behalf of a grateful community, April 23, 2018. Mr. DeCola, thank you. Thank you. Jim's always a smiling face, but he seems to be smiling a little bit more right now. It's Mr. DeCola, do you want um, countdown? Mr. DeCola, would you like an opportunity to say anything? Uh, I'd just like to say. Uh, Use the mic, Jim. You want mic? I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the board. Thank you to the town. I've really enjoyed working for the town for 30 years. Uh, it's, it's been a great ride, and uh, I just want to thank everybody. You know, Mr. DeCola, honestly, we do owe you a debt of gratitude for all the years. I think we take what you do for a living for granted a lot. You know, you don't hear a lot about safety problems or people's decks crashing in the yards or, you know, big problems created in, in our building projects because of the work you do. And I think we take it for granted. And I know there's probably been a lot of people, contractors especially, that aren't happy when you have to tell them, hey, this is wrong. But in the end, look at, we, we, you, you know when you say you don't hear about it because it's not broken, it's because of the work you and all the people in your department do. So thank you for keeping our community safe and thank you for making it a better place to live. And you should take a lot of pride in that as you go into your retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, through you, I'll just note that there are a number of town employees here, which is a further testament to the uh, respect that folks here in town all have for Jim. So, thank you all. And um, before we go into the next thing, can I just take a moment to recognize Sheila? I want to, I know, I'm sorry, but. Turn it over to you. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, related to the uh, uh, recognition we just that this took place for Mr. DeCola, a retiring building inspector, we have three new um, employees who are here this evening for introduction to the uh, to the community. Uh, two of which are department heads, and uh, one of which is a senior position in the Department of Public Works. Um, so we've chosen to recognize all three of them uh, together. I believe they are here, and I believe they are all in the room. They're all seated in the front there. Excellent. Um, so I'll go through and just do a, a brief uh, introduction, and we just thought that there might be an opportunity just for the board members yes. to put uh, uh, faces with the names, although uh, at least one is a familiar face to some of us uh, having lived here in town. Um, if we could just get the folks outside, if you could ask them to just please. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Sorry. It's usually not this crazy. i got to be honest. I, you came to a very interesting meeting this evening. So. Please so, continue. Uh, I just, uh, I'll, I'll go through with comments on each of the individual board members and yep. I'll just uh, uh, point them uh, out uh, individually for recognition. Um, first, uh, the new Youth Services Director, Jennifer Ford, who's here. If you could raise your hand, Jennifer. Yep. Well. <laughs> Jennifer uh, lives in North Reading and has been appointed to the position of Youth Services Director. She was selected from a pool of candidates who were evaluated by a screening committee that included members of the Youth Services Committee. Ms. Ford comes to us with a background in education and counseling with a focus on youth. She was most recently the program director for Teen Living Program and the Step and Step Up programs in Lynn. Did I get that right? Okay. She has a bachelor's degree in education and psychology, is a certified nursing assistant, and has a cert certificate in nonprofit human services management. Uh, her first day uh, was uh, almost two weeks ago now, I believe. So again, welcome aboard. <laughs> Second is uh, our new uh, building inspector, uh, Gerard Noel. Noel. Is it Noel or Noel, Jerry? Noel. Noel. Perfect. Gerard Noel. Uh, Mr. Noel has been appointed to the position of building inspector. He was forwarded from a pool of candidates that was reviewed by a screening committee that included the chief of police, deputy fire chief, and human resources director and was also interviewed by the town planner. Mr. Noel comes to us with inspectional services experience in Middleton and Marlborough, and is currently the building commissioner in, Fo well, was the building commissioner in Boxborough. Um, his first day was today, Monday, April 23rd. Uh, there will be a crossover period with Mr. DeCola, whose last day will be this coming Friday. Uh, Jerry, welcome. <laughs> Finally, uh, John Klipfell has been appointed to the position of town engineer. He comes to us from Jay Tropiano, where he was a superintendent and project manager for construction projects, including public construction projects. He has 11 years of en engineering experience, dating back to his experience at CDM Smith. He has a, a degree in civil engineering from Merrimack College and is a registered professional civil engineer. His first day was today, April 23rd. John Walker. <laughs> And I, I want to just recognize um, the uh, prior, build, prior engineer and um, current acting DBW director for their assistance in hiring um, John. Uh, that's Mike Sorgan and Mark Clark. So thank you very much for your, uh, your efforts. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've mentioned that there has been, uh, we've been in a period of transition in departments, and these are some of the uh, impacted departments, but uh, we're making our way through, and we're pleased to have uh, three new faces with us here. Uh, again, I want to give a, a special recognition to the members of the Youth Services Committee who volunteered their time on the screening, uh, including uh, their chairman, Mr. Majane, who I know was here, but may not be here now. Um, so thank you for your, for your support. You would like to get a picture? Would you mind if three of you come up? Mr. Collins, would be good. Yes, be good. Um, Mr. Gilberto. <laughs> Andy, no photo bomb in this. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, welcome to the community. Thank you for being a member of our team, and we look forward to working with you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Just for the new members, our open comment is not usually yet that <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so. Okay. Next on the agenda is approve the FY 2019 health insurance plan. Would you like to hold off and stick with the schedule, or do we have enough time we, we to do it? We can take that up later on. I don't believe there's anyone in the audience here for it. So. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead to the 730 Capital Improvement Planning Committee, review the fiscal year 2019 funding recommendations. And I believe there's going to be a presentation. Michael? So we have, a, uh, we have a report from the committee, which I believe has been placed in Dropbox, or is who will be being handed out in paper copy. And we have a slide that shows just the recommended projects that we'll put up. Are you all alone tonight? No, no there are members of the committee no, here. Oh, Julie's here. Abby's here. is here. Oh, is here. Good. Oh, oh my here. goodness. Kate is here. I think they'd leave me alone? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Mike is here. <laughs> Well, thank Mr. You. Chairman, but hardly before, alone. Before we ask Mr. Kelleher to pr to present it, just for you know, for those who may not be familiar with it uh, here in the room, uh, this is a committee that's meant for many months and put a lot of time in, and um, we've got a very, I think, a quality product in our capital plan because of it. So uh, it may be a fairly brief presentation. I shouldn't say fairly brief, but you're seeing four months worth of work called down to a few minutes, 45 minutes, whatever it ends up being. Yep. So I, I just would ask everyone to keep that in mind as you hear what Mr. Keller has to say. So we don't, we do have slides? Absolutely. Okay. I think this is a low budget operation. No, no, it's, 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 it's not there yet. It's not there yet. There you go. There's your hard cut. Ms. Rourke, over to you. I can start. Okay. First, I want to thank my committee members, who I think most are here, uh, for all, all of their work on this, particularly Liz. She really does uh, all, all of the, the heavy lifting on this. And uh, the rest of us uh, try to sit in, listen, um, talk about stuff, and uh, come to some recommendations for you folks to make the, the final decision. Um, this year, um, as you can see in the, the report that, that's in here, um, we had requests of about $2.3 million in capital re, uh, requests this year. Uh, we're recommending um, uh, about one, almost $1.6 million. Uh, we're, gonna, we're recommending bonding a little over a million and using cash for about a half a million dollars. So. Um, this is the, the, the table that's in, in, the, uh, in the book. Um, this is no different the, than what we have in our packets, right? Um, it, it should be in the FY19 budget folder. Yeah. Okay, thank you. By, by way of background, um, when the committee was formed several years ago, uh, one of our charges was that um, that we review the, the needs of the town from all of the departments, um, recommend to, to the board those items which we think we ought to be either fixing or acquiring. Uh, but another, another factor was that we didn't want to increase the debt service of the town. We wanted to manage us in such a way that the debt service uh, would, would remain at a constant level. Uh, again, this year we're, we're, we're holding to that. Um, the, the agreement was that we would, we would hold debt service at $1.1 million a year, uh, exclusive of the, the work that was approved a couple of years ago for the Little School Roof, which came in after the fact and was treated as, as, as an outlier. But we have, we have uh, held to that, uh, and that kind of guides us in, in where we cut things off. We looked at, uh, as I say, about 25 items, uh, talked with the department managers, uh, did field visits um, uh, to look at either facilities or equipment that was being, uh, um, there was a request to either repair, replace, or, or to, to, to modify in some way. Uh, and then we all ranked them individually. 
And after the ranking, the, uh, the, our individual ranking, uh, Liz compiled that ranking and gave us an aggregate ranking so we could see where we all um, fell on this and what order the, the recommendations were coming in. Then we discussed them to make sure that there weren't any questions or misunderstandings on what it was that we were looking at or, or, or we thought was, was being requested. Um, Liz and I worked after that to see, okay, what fits? Um, and this is the result of that. So where we are in this, and I can't read that, but I'll read it from here. Uh, as I say, we're, we've got um, the top part of this page are the items that we're recommending. And I'll, I'll go through them quickly, and if there are questions, then we can take the questions. Uh, the first one in, that, that got the highest rating, the ratings go from zero to five, okay? So the top one was the INET, and it received a rating of 4.89. Everybody thought that was extremely important that we do it. Um, we need to replace it. Um, Comcast has is, uh, is, is, is put us in position that we, don't, we can't use the, the current system. Um, and we needed to do this in order to have communication uh, among all of the, the town facilities. So it's a cost of about $350,000. There may be some offset to that in money from Comcast and or uh, uh, Verizon. Uh, we're not sure, but if there is, that's good. If not, we get a, we get a $350,000 cost that, that needs to be dealt with. We're proposing bonding this for 10 years. Uh, the next item on here is a, the, uh, is the uh, computer devices for the, the school system. Uh, this is an annual amount of $60,000 to get us to a one-on-one -on -one device to student. We're not there yet, but it's, it's moving in that direction. The, the next is the stormwater compliance. Uh, we're required to, to do this. We didn't do it last year, but we, we have to do it this year. It's a $30,000 item, and we're proposing that that be, be paid for with cash that we've got available, as is the computer devices. Uh, the exhaust removal for the DPW garage. Uh, when we did our field visit to the garage, one of the things that, that concerned most of us was that it was not a good situation there. In the wintertime, the trucks are all inside to get them started before they go out to plow snow or, or, or do whatever they need to do in, in the inclement weather. Uh, the current situation is they raise the, the garage doors to kind of air, air the place out. Um, it's been, they've been doing that for years, but uh, we felt uh, that the, the request by DPW to do some sort of an air handling system in there made a lot of sense. This is really a safety issue and it, it needed, needed to be replaced and frankly probably should have come up even before this year. Uh, computer replacements for the town, 35,000, that again is a, uh, an annual amount in order to keep the, the computer inventory up to date. Sidewalk machine uh, that, uh, of nearly, nearly $100,000. We have one sidewalk plow in town. Uh, if, it's, if it's down, we're not able to maintain the, the sidewalks that we do for the schools. Um, this gives us some, some redundancy there. And also, I believe, some ability to do some more plowing uh, on Main Street, although I'm, I'm not sure that the final decision has been made on that. But we're hoping that, that that's what it's gonna be used for. Fire Department had a request in for two cars. Um, and they're both about the same age. Um, we recommended one of them and said we'll, we'll, we'll pass on the, sec the other one until next year because we, we, we needed to get some other things in and we just didn't have enough, enough cash available to do both of them. Can, the, Mr. can I ask you a yeah. question on this particular Sure, one? go right ahead. You know, in the past, we haven't had the markings on any of our fire department vehicles and there's, there's no markings. There's no, um, yeah. yeah, there's no sales on the side of them. But can we make sure that this year when we get these new vehicles, they, they are properly yeah. marked? You know, it's something that's been brought up on this board when I first got here. And I believe under, you, under the uh, rules and the way we were supposed to label our cars, except for the police. Police and fire, but yes. Right. 
uh, no, even, even the fire. We should have these with the markings, the proper markings, with the North Reading seal on them on the side. So I'm, I don't, certainly don't have an objection to it. I, I'll consult with the fire chief and the public safety director relative to the implementation to make sure there's no unintended consequence. Like on his face, I don't see it being a concern. Um, but if you, if you read the policy, you, you'll see it's right in there. So I'm not sure which policy it is that we're speaking to, but it, the, uh, the policy that I worked to develop with the finance director, I yeah. believe it was in 2014, mm -hmm. it didn't, it specifically by design, did not apply to police or fire. That's not to say that there isn't some value in it, yeah. um, but we'll follow up on that. The fire, the fire vehicles should be late. They should oh, be I'm not disagreeing with the, the, with the, the comment. Thank you. Um, the gym floor in the little school, uh, this was another uh, uh, review that we did on, with a field trip to the school. Um, looking at it, looking at the condition of it, um, thought this was a, a prime candidate for, for some uh, uh, replacement. Um, it, uh, it's tiles, and as you can see in the picture up there, some of them have come up and have been put back in. and. Uh, 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 it gets an awful lot of use, the kids in the school, and I think also from some other uh, youth sports activities. So we thought that was an appropriate item. Town roads. Um, we've been trying for some time to uh, build a reliable <coughs> capital contribution for town roads of $300,000. We haven't got it done every year, but this is to supplement the uh, the chapter 90 money, which is about this year, is going to be about $815,000. Um, I think we need to keep this up. In fact, I think maybe we ought to be doing more. Um, I looked at the uh, the first time that we looked at the the road program. I think was in 2012, um, and looked at the condition of the roads and the 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 the, 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 the rating of the roads and a rating of 80 is deemed to be acceptable we were somewhere in the 70s i don't know what we are now but i suspect we're somewhat less than that um by by example um back in 2012 um we had some 11 miles of roads that were that the the consultant said it needed reclamation that number is about 22 miles of roads now. So I think we've gone backwards. Um, and uh, I would encourage the, the new DPW director when he or she comes on board uh, to work with the consultant to um, either this consultant or somebody else if this is the wrong, the wrong firm, um, put together a plan, stick to the plan, and see if we can't uh, make some, some headway in improving the conditions of the roads in town because I think we, I think over the last several years have, have gone backwards. We've, we've lost, uh, we've lost uh, some of the, uh, the quality in our roads and uh, we, need to, we need to recover that. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, public safety, <clears throat> uh, building foundation repairs. Uh, we've made a number of attempts at this and um, there is a leak and the leak, um, uh, has gone into the evidence room in the police department. Uh, they've had to do some moving things around. Uh, an attempt was made to fix it a couple of years ago. Apparently it was not successful. It's been looked at again by some fresh eyes and are told that this should take care of the problem. So we're, we're recommending this uh, yet again. Uh, the multifunction activity vehicle for the schools. This has been on the list probably for the last three years. I think when we first saw it, we said what a great idea because it um, will allow us to take the smaller teams to wherever their, their, their games are being played without renting a, a, a vehicle. Um, the school department is, is picking up a third of the cost of this in their operating budget this year and this represents the other two thirds. It had a payback when we looked at it of about three to four years. So this seemed to make an awful lot of sense. And uh, this year it, it is being recommended. Um, technology, 
technology instructional equipment. Uh, this is for the school department, uh, for the for the uh, elementary schools. It's whiteboards and 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 uh, and the like. It's updating that that equipment that is it's gotten a little bit old. Some of it was hand me downs from the middle and high school, the old middle and high school, and it is there's some need to replace them. Uh, the DPW uh, uh, roof, this is another big one. Uh, the roof is leaking uh, and uh, we need to do something with it. There, there, are, there, are, there is water, you can, if you walk through the, the building, you can see where it, it is coming through. There have been some repair attempts made to it, but the, uh, uh, upon inspection it was, it was deemed that the roof, roof needs to be repaired. It's a big item um, and it's uh, on the bonding schedule for, for 25 years. And the final item that we have uh, are recommending is a wheeled loader um, for the for DPW. Um, there is one now. This would provide some uh, additional support for winter and and summer in uh, the needs of, of of this piece of equipment. The bottom of it are the things that we didn't do, and uh, they will will stay on there. We will look at them again. I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, well, yes, Mr. Missary. So I'm looking at the totals of the cash. Yep. And as you're adding, uh, you get to three hundred fifty-six thousand eight thirty-five, and then it goes down. Can you explain that, or is that an error? That's an error. Okay. The total. The total is. I think it was we moved something afterwards. Yeah. So the error, the, the 5,004, 504, 035 is, is the is the total number. It is the total number. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe when we move stuff around, we lost some of the formula in there. Okay. 504 is the answer. 504 is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, as I say, the, the other items that uh, will be looked at um, by the committee, uh, along with the fiscal 2021 and 22 items, will be the remaining items from fiscal 19 that we were not able to recommend this time. Uh, on the in the the um, enterprise, the only recommendation we had, the only request we had, was some uh, paving at Ipswich River Park uh, from Parks and Rec. Um, that will fit within their their. Um, uh, uh, retained earnings, so they've got room to, to take care of that, and that, that'll be done. There are a couple of other smaller items they're going to do out of their operating budget. Um, we did not get any requests from Hillview, and uh, the water we're going, we're meeting on Wednesday, providing you guys make some, some decisions tonight. If not, we'll meet after you've made a decision and take a look to see what, what, uh, what we need to do uh, with respect to, to uh, the water uh, enterprise. Um, the next page is, 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 is I'm not going to go through it, it is simply the, the, uh, um, the formulas that we go through to make sure that we're, we've got a, a plan that goes out for, uh, for the, the, the next five years that um, we're uh, in the top part, we're, we're, what we're going to be able to recommend given what we know today. Uh, on on capital, um, what the debt service is in the middle on is what is already on the books and what we're recommending, and then the bottom is the status of the the uh, uh, the stabilization fund. And the stabilization fund is entering this year at about a million dollars. It'll end up the end of the year somewhat less than that, at about 922. Um, and projecting it out over the next next five years will be about a million one, a million two at the end of this this time period. That's very fluid. It depends upon what um, the length of time things are being bonded, how much we're we we're, we we're going to try to do in in cash. Um, we're going to as if on the top of it, we're going to try to or recommend right now about a four hundred fifty thousand dollar a year. Uh, cash. It's down somewhat from what we've been doing over the last couple of years, but there have been some very big capital items that were put on last year that, that have an impact on this. Um, I'm not sure if it's in here or not, but um, 
There are um, a lot of very expensive um, long-term projects coming down the pike. Um, I alluded to them in the cover memo. Um, and with any luck, I'll even find it. I, do, I did find it. Um, over the next three years, uh, items of over $100,000, and there are, there, are, there are a lot of them um, that we're, we're going to need to consider. There are more there than we can possibly do. Um, so again, we're going to have to, to make some choices. One of the ones that, that stands out is items that, that are being recommended for town hall. And it comes to almost two and a half million dollars worth of, of items. So I think some long, hard decisions have got to be made about the status of the building, how long we're going to be in this building, um, and what kind of money we want to, to spend here. Um, the boiler in 2021 needs to be replaced to a tune of almost $900,000. Uh, the plumbing, the estimate that we have right now is almost that amount or a little bit more than that for plumbing. So there are a whole bunch of things that are, that are on this, this list that came out of the request. We've at, we asked the department heads to give us not only the current 2019 uh, requests, but to show us what was coming down, coming down the line, mm -hmm. so that we could kind of think about how we're going to deal with it, and that's part of this, this table you're looking looking at here, was to see what can we, what can we do. Um, a lot of these would probably be long-term bond, bonding items, but um, we can only do so much. So, well, we have that feasibility study that we still have to do that we got the funding from town meeting, and uh, and I know we've been. I think we have a schedule to do it at some point, but I think that'll be an important study to, yep. before we maybe take on some of the stuff, we get that study completed, I think it'll be helpful for you. Yep. Do we have a, a rough timeline when you think we can get that RFP on the street for that? I, I see it right now tied to the hiring of the Public Works Director. Yep. Uh, if we come to a situation where we're not making an appointment to, in the short order, then sure. we'll evaluate another strategy. But yep. Uh, we're in the midst of that process right now, the meaning the, um, the, the uh, evaluation, the second evaluation of candidates, and I hope to come to a conclusion within the next few weeks. Yeah. And some of these things would depend upon timing. One of the items in here is the Park Street Bridge. It's a million two item. Uh, if we are able to get a, a, a grant for it, our cost is going to be $700,000. But the, the, uh, I don't think there was an appetite to go forward with it without the grant. But if we get it, then we probably have to act fairly quickly. Yep. Um, and that's, that's a $700,000 hit to, to us for that and with a half million dollars from, from the state. But uh, that's probably the, 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 the one of the, that is one of the biggest things on here. But I look down the list and I see four and a half million dollars in, in requests for 2020. Mm -hmm. um, all by itself of items that are $100,000 or more. And we know there's going to be probably a half million dollars as there was this year in items of smaller amounts that we're going to have to deal with. So I think we have to stay committed to the roads, like you said. I, I don't think we can take a hire off the ball on that any. I don't either. And, and if somebody uh, said that the 300000 isn't enough and we've got the capacity to do the work, um, and, and wanted that number raised, I think that would have to be given serious consideration yeah. because, as I say, I personally, I just think we're falling behind. Yeah. Make no, good I, intentions, I, I but I think we're I falling behind. Around. It's getting worse. I also, even some of these newer developments, you know, not what I would call them new, but they're 20 years old, but some of these roads are really in bad shape. Some of them are 40 or 50 years yeah. old, Mike. I know. That's what I'm, I mean, yeah. even the 20 year olds are starting to become bad now, and the 40 or 50s are. Beyond, I think, repair. Well, that's why I think the reclamation number of miles that are in the, the reclamation uh, list in, in this report from the consultant is yeah. as long as it is. Who's the consultant? Beta. Beta. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mr. Keller, if you could explain to the public, I think that's a very good point uh, as far as the cost when we have to reclaim a road. Uh, if you could maybe explain to the public the difference between if we can catch it a year too early than a year too late, so to speak. 
Well, the, the longer you wait, obviously the worse condition is going to be. And so what you, and I'm, I'm no, not certainly holding myself as an ex expert in, in road repair, because I'm not. Uh, but um, the, 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 the cost of, of reclamation, and then there are others here that can probably explain this better than me, um, are, you know, more digging, more, re more, more, more uh, changing in the surface of the road to, to, to repair it than it is if you're just doing some other other remedial work on and if the I road. recall it's about three times the prices um, yeah it probably is yeah. um, but it, it, it's it's a lot of money uh, and the longer you wait the more that get in that condition and that was the point I was trying to make earlier that we've got tw twice as many miles and my, my calculation of this in in that category than we had in 2012 not good well, I do have one other question for sure. you. In last year's presentation, we had asked for it. Maybe we forgot to ask for it this year, but our review on the past year's yes. capital. Do we have I mean, that? At least list? one slide. Do we have one yes, tonight? We, we do have one. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Look at that. Huh? prepared. That'd be Thank great. You. Is that possible to throw up on the screen? We do review that as well. You do? Yeah. Okay. That's probably the first, our first meeting of the year is say, okay, where are we? What have we got, what have we got done that was, that's already been approved? Well, while Ms. Ms. Rourke is pulling that up, I, I want to kind of get back to the building thing and the feasibility study. And I do, would like to see that as a priority once we have the new DPW director in place. Because, you know, as bad as this building is, the fire department, the fire building is pretty bad too. And uh, even though we put a Band-Aid on it for now, uh, you know, you, it's, it's coming to its age and the community is growing we're bringing new more people in their apparatus is getting bigger I believe right mm -hmm. chief um, and I think we have to keep that in mind as well amongst all the other things that you have in here and the, the building on the common is another one it, yeah. it is in need of, of, of replacing the, the clavid siding on it at least some of it maybe all of it yeah. um, we had an estimate of about hundred and fifty thousand dollars this year for some repair to it, we've asked for a more, more detailed look at that to see, yeah. you know, what we can do, what the historic uh, commission would would approve. You know, there are composite materials that could be used that would have a longer life. That's going to be an expensive project, but it needs to get done. If we're going to preserve yeah. that kind of it's a, a building, beautiful building, you got to do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Liz. So we have FY17 and FY18 approved capital projects and the status of each uh, capital project. I don't know if you want me to go through them one by one. You just want to look at them, see where things stand. Just if we could just quickly hit the ones that are still uh, in progress. Sure. And if we can just get kind of a rough idea when you think they'll be, because it looks like you get a lot of complete, at least for FY17. Yes. Some of them I may not be able to speak to. Um, I may defer to Mark Clark, the acting DPW director, as he is here, um, as several of them, or all of them, are um, DPW water related. But I do know that the fire station interior improvements um, are almost complete. There's a very small remaining balance. A lot of work has been done there. Even the um, fire chief probably can speak to uh, what is remaining to be done, but you can see that there's only 37,000 remaining. Um, the other small amount under town buildings, this is the amount that gets approved for miscellaneous town building repairs. So it could be to replace a window in the town clerk's office that is damaged or to put the darkening film on, on windows, replace carpets. Um, so I know this remaining balance, at, at least to my understanding, is for the DPW director's office. There was an old air conditioner that was in the wall, and it's to fix the window. It was basically to replace the windows in that office. Right, so to replace the windows in the DPW director's office. So that is going to be complete. Um, the next item is install water conservation devices and I know that Julie the building superintendent has begun this project I don't know I believe some of them started at the fire station but I, I don't know the exact status of that 
Um, and the remaining are water items, and I'm not going to speak to those. So either the town administrator or Mark Clark can speak to those. Um, you know, a lot of them have to do with what direction we go in, but you can so. see that we did purchase the pump station land. Um, other than that, minor amounts of funds have been expended from the other line items. Okay. It, it's exactly correct. Uh, just quickly looking at this, those that are not completed in the water are tied to the MWRA and over yep. selection. That's great. And we have spent uh, the <coughs> first 50000 plus in water distribution system upgrades. Those are the water main work that we do sometimes in advance of repaving. Yep. So some of that work has, has occurred. And then the, uh, the work on the fire station is done, and that's just the... You came in under budget. No, so no, 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 no. That's no, not what I said. Not 100%. No. Um, the work is almost all done. There oh. is still some things to be done. Um, I'm not aware of what those items are. Okay. Um, but there are still some items to be complete. Okay. Yeah, sure. Just grab the microphone sure. if you want to mind. So. A large portion of the work at the fire station has been completed. Uh, most of the first floor has been done and asbestos has been abated. Uh, the remaining area on the first floor is the dispatch area, which we're waiting because we do have some more improvements to, to do there regarding our dispatch area. Um, work on the second floor and the day room and the kitchen has been completed. It looks great. Thank you for your support. Um, but we're also holding off on the bunk room portion uh, as we're coming up with different models to conform that area. So that's the remaining work at the fire station. Thank you. You're welcome. So that's for FY17. Um, for FY18 project status update, this is a list of approved projects. Um, you can see that some are completed, some are uh, ongoing, and some have uh, yet to be started. But I'll just note the ones that have yet to be started, again, um, are related to water. Um, so the fire microwave communications is complete and up and running. So that is a great accomplishment. Um, the library flat roof repair is has a remaining balance of $14,000. I'm not sure if it's complete or, you know, if there's more to be done with that, but a majority, a majority of it was expended already. Um, town Road, this is now when they begin using the yep. Town Road funds. Um, they receive, DPW receives Chapter 90 and Town Road funds July 1st. So they have a very short window of time that they can, you know, use those funds. Um, and they use Chapter 90 first as town road money is bonded money. So if we don't need to go out and borrow for something yet while they're still using another pot of money, um, they use town road last. We had a meeting this morning um, or this afternoon with the new town engineer, the acting um, DPW director, as well as the operations manager of DPW to go over the lists of roads um, from previous fiscal years, what was done, what wasn't done, what their strategy is, and how they're going to move forward. So they are going to begin doing town road work um, between now and the end of the fiscal year. And then when the new fiscal year begins, they'll have their new Chapter 90 allotment, and they can work on the FY19 roads that they have said that they're going to work on. And then they will, again, have town road funds um, that are bonded funds that they will expend probably around this time next year. Uh, the next one is the IT computer replacement plan. Our IT director started last March um, and there was still um, quite a bit of money left from the previous fiscal year so he is working on our five-year computer replacement plan so it is ongoing um, and some of those funds have been expended and we continue to replace computers on a, a daily and a weekly basis. Uh, the next one would be the bathroom facilities at the field. So the bathroom facilities at the field are almost complete, um, as we all know, but they have not expended all of the pots of money that they had. So there was some money that came from free cash, and this is the bonded piece of that um, that we haven't expended from yet. Uh, let's see. 
the replace engine three, um, I can let the, speak, the chief speak to this, but it is ordered, it takes quite some time to get that engine built. Um, so we have not gone long term on borrowing this for this piece of equipment. So it does take some time, but we need the appropriation in place because you have to pay per piece. You pay for the chassis and you pay for the other pieces, but the chief can speak better to that than I can. Yeah, just as a point of clarification, it, it hasn't been ordered yet. We're vetting out three different vendors. We're, we're close to the point of ordering it, um, so it should be done within the next uh, month, I would say. And to, to the finance director's point, it does take about a year for that truck to get built, so we're almost there. And it will fit in the facility as structured today? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Um. I do not know the status of the police station plumbing repairs. They are ongoing. Some money has been spent. I know a new water heater was purchased. I'm looking at the police chief. So they are ongoing, correct? Today, yeah, today they replaced water heater. Okay. I'm not sure about the other repairs are. Okay. Um, library plumbing repairs. Again, no funds have been expended expended from that, so I'm not sure the status of, of that at this time. I don't know if the DPW director does. Okay. And then the remaining items are um, water items. Please. I did want to just speak to a couple of the water items. Uh, the first one there is the water meter replacement. That was the supplement to our town-wide water meter replacement. I do want to say we, so we did a pilot test, and there's probably three or four people in this room that do have the new meters in their homes. I want to say thank you to the, the town hall and some of the finance committee members who uh, stepped up to be the uh, guinea pigs in that program. Um, so what we've done is we've made, we're started to mail out uh, appointment cards, and we're doing it by sections of town. So if you haven't got one, don't worry, you will be getting one. But the first of those have gone out on or about May 1st, we're, gonna, uh, we're scheduling the initial appointments to start that first section of town. So we're looking at that going on between about May 1st and sometime late in this year uh, to replace all the water meters in town. Um, the, the three large items at the very bottom there, the, the million plus dollar ticket items, those are all relating to us going to MWRA. And obviously, if the decision is made that we stay with Andover, that money will be rescinded. It, will be, uh, it won't be borrowed. We won't spend any of that money. Michael. Mr. Masseri. Question regarding the uh, water meter replacement. Uh, since we're discussing it, I got a postcard, and I'm sure other people are starting to get them. And one of the comments on there was that you got to clean, uh, clear an area six feet in diameter against the wall. Do I tear the wall down? I think it's going to bring some questions. And, and believe me, that already has brought some questions. They need room enough to be able to get to your meter. If you look at the meter itself, it has two nuts on either end that are seven inches apart. They need to be able to take the nuts off that old meter, pull them out, pop the meter out, put a new meter in, and tighten now, the nuts. I, I think up. I understand that. I, my comment was related to the info on the postcard. Perhaps they should change it. Again, it's, a, it's probably stock language they've used in every town they've done that to say that, that five or six foot diameter around the meter. And it, yeah, it, it is confusing to people. That's probably the one question we've had that is most frequent relative to the, uh, the meter replacement so far. Anything else? Board members, any questions? Just, just as far as the uh, clapboards and coining on the library, what's, that was on the docket there for a while. Uh, I don't know what happened. It, that. It, was, it was on again this year, um, and we we've asked the uh, uh, the DPW building department to go back and look to see if there are any other materials that could be used, mm -hmm. um, and I, it will be up for for consideration next year. And we just we just put it off for this year because we didn't have enough information. No, it just continues to deteriorate too. So that's the yeah yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Well, Mr. Kelleher, on behalf of the entire board, I want to thank you and the entire capital improvement uh, planning group 
for all your time and effort. We know it isn't done overnight. It is over our entire year. Uh, so I know uh, once you walk out this room, you're going to start the process for next year as well. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just also meet after you guys decide on water to fi finish this year. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Julie Kopke, you know, I know she's going to, you know, miss the Capital Improvement Planning Committee probably more than the school committee. But again, thank you for your service and uh, yeah. enjoy your time away. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you, Julie. We're Kay. a happier crew. <laughs> I'll take a motion if we have one. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the fiscal year 2019 capital expenditures as recommended by the Cal Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Second. I have a motion and a second. Second. And a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. FY 2019 <coughs> budget hearing. Do we need presentation? Do you we have a, a presentation which uh, I'll ask the finance director when she's done preparing the technology in, in the room to upload to the Dropbox folder for ease of reference, the budget folder. And while that's being loaded, if you don't mind, I'm going to excuse myself and Mrs. Minupelli can run things for a second. I just need to. Certainly. We are, Madam right. Vice Chair. Take it away, Mike. Thank you. Uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation uh, this evening relative to the Division of Public Safety, uh, Public Safety Administration. Um, this is the last department that uh, the board will be uh, hearing from uh, during the budget uh, hearings uh, for fiscal year 2019. Um, just as a way of background <coughs> for those uh, maybe in the audience or watching at home who may not have followed, but uh, we uh, board voted to approve the implementation of a public safety director position uh, in February of this current year, um, carrying us through the conclusion of fiscal year 2018, which will be this June 30th, 2018. The presentation this evening talks a bit about that um, in the context not only of the fiscal year 18, but also fiscal year 2019, um, for which this presentation is probably most applicable. Bear with me while we apparently have some technical difficulties. That's why we need the capital improvements. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So this is a, 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 a re-presentation of some points I brought forward to the board in February. Um, why did we request this in fiscal year 2018? Phil, are you catching the audio pretty well, the way I'm standing here? Okay. Um, so why was this requested? Uh, we talked about foreseeing a growth in public safety needs um, attributed to a few factors, including substance abuse, population growth, and demographic change, as well as the impact of our desired commercial growth. Uh, transition going on in multiple uh, fire department positions as well as inspectional services departments 
and the increasing expectations placed upon emergency management. We talked a little bit about that transition earlier this evening. Uh, looking at the sustainability of the fire department staffing approach, um, specifically looking at the reliance on callback to provide that first alarm response and the manner in which we implement that. Um, looking at civilian dispatch and the potential to consolidate dispatch as civilian, freeing up existing police and fire personnel to address growth related needs. Um, there's also a response to some board feedback relative to um, myself and the individuals in my position being able to delegate their responsibilities. Um, and we also felt that the timing was appropriate because we were in the midst of the budget recommendation process at that point in time back in January and February for fiscal year 2019. This chart shows the administrative divisions of the town without the public safety director position being in place. Um, you can see the number of direct reports to the town administrator. Um, the uh, two divisions in which we previously had implemented the division head position were public works, which has a director, and finance, which also has a director. Um, when you look at the current public safety table of organization with the director positions filled, you see that there are uh, five divisions that show up here um, that are now uh, underneath that uh, director supervision, specifically uh, police, fire, emergency management, building, and health. Uh, this slide talks about the uh, existing staffing in the public safety departments that fall under the, underneath the umbrella. The goals I outlined for the public safety director over the course of fiscal year 2018 and 19 um, and beyond, consistency of policies among the public safety departments where, they're, where practical, having a unified overall command structure pursuant to our town charter, Again, that idea of planning for long-range public safety uh, services, providing the additional administrative support for transitioning departments, supporting and improving emergency management, and the fresh eyes perspective uh, for uh, opportunity for innovation to have a uniform public safety official who could challenge and question the status quo. Again, this slide about, talks about dispatch, which is something that we're, we're looking at implementing in fiscal year 2019, and we spoke about that at the Saturday budget hearing. It was presented by the police department, and we've targeted an implementation date for uh, April of next year, which is the last three months of this upcoming fiscal year. We looked at the potential imp implementation options. Again, this is a slide that the board has seen previously, um, you know, trying to keep an open mind. Establishing a dedicated standalone director position we estimated that cost would be um, upwards of $125,000 plus benefits, perhaps as high as $175,000. Um, we looked at a part-time standalone position, um, feeling that the part-time presence was unlikely to be as effective as a full-time employee. Uh, contracting out the services, um, we looked at that, but we, we feel, felt the responsibilities were such that they needed to be held by an employee. We ultimately landed on the combined position, very similar to the finance director. Uh, town accountant position which Ms. Rourke holds in the finance division. It was the recommended course of action, the chief of police carrying public safety director responsibilities um, with a cost of $30,000 plus a fiscal year 2019 allocation of $10,000 for any required overtime in the police department in the event um, there were administrative duties that needed to be fulfilled uh, by someone other than the police chief. This slide is just a bit of a progress update. Um, in terms of things that have happened in the um, few weeks that we've been in, uh, in place, um, guiding the hiring and promotional process uh, in fire. So when we promoted the chief, we created a vacancy behind him. We then had a retirement, which created a second vacancy of the same rank. Um, promotions beyond that create vacancies in the fire department at the firefighter level. So it's a so-called domino effect that requires uh, quite a bit of effort. Um, and again, doesn't just happen however we want it to happen. It happens within the confines and the constraints of the civil service process, um, you know, which has worked as we've moved through the process, but obviously has its restrictions. And having a professional, uh, public safety professional with experience in that has certainly helped us move those hiring processes al along and advance the missions of the department and its, uh, and its chief, being the fire chief. The um, hiring of a new building inspector, which we talked about earlier, I won't belabor that point. Uh, the budget process, reviewing the fiscal year 18 and 19 budget, um, recommendations and adjustments um, uh, made uh, were, uh, were necessary and will be reviewed 
later on uh, this evening, or actually in the next agenda item. Um, looking to streamline the processes and procedures amongst the public safety departments. Um, that, that's been happening um, on an ongoing uh, basis. Um, uh, probably most um, interestingly, it's been happening as much as it in the fire department as it has been here in the town hall. So it's been, you know, again, this really was a discussion about multiple departments and, and it's happening um, and I think we believe it's been productive. Um, again, reviewing current practices and procedures to identify inefficiencies, that's something that's been ongoing. We've talked a lot over the past three years, probably more, four years, I should, I should say, and probably more about exploring software for permits and in both the health, uh, in the health and building departments as well as the fire department. And that's something that Mr. Noel will uh, play an, an active role in, but there will be administrative oversight by the public safety director. Um, recommending and uh, installing new programming at the fire department, uh, similar to the digital police headquarters that we use in the police department. Again, uh, an option where there's an avenue that was out there to try to modernize and give the management who are being, who are being held accountable by, my, by myself, the board, and the community to have the tools to manage. So uh, very quickly, we've done, taken some steps to try to improve that, but there's a lot of work to be done. And again, uh, freeing up the town administrator um, to dedicate resources uh, to non-public safety matters where needed. So that's the conclusion of the slideshow, just to give folks kind of an idea of what the intention was to give a broad update relative to where things um, stand. I'll give you my candid you know, feedback. Um, looking at this, I think it, it's achieved everything that I hoped it would achieve um, in, in a short amount of time. And I think it will achieve all of the things that I have hoped it, that it would achieve when I brought this forward to the board back in February. Um, and I, I think that's for a variety of reasons. Again, timing probably being the most important one. Having a seasoned department head um, available and able to step in in that fashion, um, having the transition in the departments and having um, yeah, the opportunity to maybe change the direction over where things have gone in, in, in the various departments um, where, um, where needed, um, I think that, it, that it's worked well for us so far. And um, I think that there uh, it certainly merits implementate, continued implementation of fiscal year 2019. That concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Do we have any questions or maybe we make any comments on this budget? Mr. Bird, you have you um any of the department support on it? Do they have anything? I mean, I, I've talked to the, you know department heads, and I, I know that they have informally um, indicated their support. I spoke with them this evening, and said that they certainly could have the opportunity to speak. Um, speak their mind as to how they think it's working uh, or, or not working. Um, or the members of the Finance Committee for that matter, I know that there was a discussion held by the Finance Committee back in um, uh, early April or end of March relative to this budget as well. So I turn it over to the Fire Chief. <laughs> Please, to the podium if you don't mind. Thank you. I just wanted to take a brief minute to let you know that speaking about the public safety director as a new uh, chief and department head, it's been extremely helpful to me um, in some of the bullet points that were that were illustrated on the slideshow <clears throat> to have somebody to fall back on that's already been there and, and walked that road and you know, navigating the promotional processes and dealing with civil service. Um, bouncing ideas about where I wanted to go with the department in so far as something as simple as, as different computer software, and then getting uh, the chief's perspective on what he's done, and seeing uh, seeing where we could take that. So, it's been very helpful to me personally. So, thank you for the support. Thank you, Mr. Bracy, and then Mrs. Harlberg. Okay. Thank you. I just want to echo the chief's uh, comments. I know uh, for us at the Board of Health, um, Chief Murphy has been uh, extremely helpful. Um, we've had some you know, uh, tie-ups in the past with streamlining administrative processes where you know, unfortunately the town administrator has been extremely busy um, you know, with getting back to POs and, and things like that to kind of keep the flow going for us with our you know, Title V consultant, uh, food service consultant. Um, I know Chief Murphy has been extremely helpful in that process alone 
um, that has helped expedite that process where, again, you know, Mike's busy meetings and stuff like that. Um, he's also been helpful in other areas with, you know, guidance and, and you know, support for us with the administrative staff when I've been on vacation. Um, because we're just a one-man show here, myself and, and my administrative assistant, Amy Dachara. So when I'm not around, we, we do have a, a temporary fill-in, but Chief Murphy has, you know, stepped up to make sure on a daily basis that, you know, if there's anything that Amy may have needed or any kind of technical support, um, he's been there. Um, you know, another issue, a perfect example is today, we had an issue with, um, you know, an attorney calling us and, um, you know, Chief Murphy took the reins on that after him and I had discussed and he kind of streamlined that conversation with the attorney, which I think helped expedite the situation, one, and two, um, it helped us from not having to go to Copeland and Page, where, again, I think that saved the town some money by just him doing that alone. So I've talked to the Board of Health uh, on this on a couple of different occasions, and, and they're very supportive of the Director of Public Safety being there in that capacity, um, and so I think it's worked out great for us. Thank you. Mrs. Herbert. Uh, the Finance Committee, for the most part, saw the preliminary uh, discussion at the BOS meeting in February concerning this. And last week at our Finance Committee, we further discussed it. And as a part of our budget review, uh, we voted unanimously to support it. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other questions? Any more state? Mr. O'Leary. Yeah. Uh, glad to hear it's working well, but I still remain opposed to uh, the concept and idea. Again, I think uh, a lot of what's been facilitated and helpful and uh, uh, should be part of the organization's uh, uh, method of operations anyway. I think that the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, and again, I don't see the need for a public safety director. I don't see any of the community around us like sized. I don't see any community around us that is uh, twice the size that has a, a similar setup. And uh, I think the uh, costs associated with it, it's not the $30,000, it's the fact that we have an employee that's going to be getting well in excess of $200,000 a year. I said it's not warranted. <coughs> Uh, I don't think any position in the community at this particular juncture and point in time uh, warrants that type of a salary. And I think uh, the public should be um, well aware and be able to weigh in on it. Uh, and again, I nothing to take away from it. Chief Murphy does a terrific job for us, runs a great department, and has been extremely helpful uh, with anybody who reaches out to him. Uh, I just think that it's a, it's a bad precedent for us to, to be setting. I think that the, uh, the salary levels is something that... Uh, uh, we're going to be have to uh, looking at going forward to sustain. I don't think it's sustainable, uh, and I think that uh, you know if there are other resources needed, you know, for the town administrator to free himself up to um, meet his mandate under the charter, then we should be looking and talking about that. I don't think we should be creating a public safety director to oversee the board of health. I don't think we need a public safety director to oversee the fire department. I don't believe we need a public safety director to oversee the building inspector. You know, uh, there may be even some questions in relation to whether or not some of these individuals can even legally answer to this individual. So it's, um, I just think this, the structure is unnecessary. I think the uh, cost associated with it, uh, well, it's, you know, only $30,000. I think what we're doing is setting a precedent for uh, uh, continuing to uh, fund this position going forward. And again, it's, it's, it, it doesn't warrant it. Uh, so I remain opposed to it. Uh, I applaud the efforts that have been put forth and the uh, uh, progress that's been made. Again, I think some of the progress that has been made should have been able to have been made anyway, um, regardless of whether you have a public safety director or not. Uh, I believe that the town administrator should again still remain the ultimate uh, uh, person responsible for uh, hiring of department heads, overseeing them, and uh, I don't think putting another layer of uh, senior management is warranted, and I don't intend on supporting it. 
and I think uh, you know, as far as what happens at town meeting, I haven't decided yet whether or not I'll offer an amendment to, uh, um, to remove the $30,000, but that may very well be the case. Mr. Schultz. I, I think it's a little bit misleading to say it's a $200,000 position. It's a $30,000 position, and it's going to save this town so much more than that over you know, every year and year, year over, over, over and over again. I, I'm not sure why you have the opposition to this, because to me, you've just heard the department heads all saying this is really helping us. It's working. We're trying to streamline some departments that have had some trouble in the past, and we're able to do that now, and it's working. Why would we want to stop going on that path it's for $30,000? To me, I don't, you know, I respect your opposition. I don't understand it. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's just my two cents. Again, I, I think if I, uh, if, if I were to uh, maybe have weighed in a little bit sooner, or been asked to weigh in a little bit sooner, and we had discussed this in years previous, you know, there is no doubt there's an awful lot of uh, uh, work on the town administrator's desk and plate. Uh, to me, you know, resources and additional administrative staff is probably as warranted, if not more warranted, uh, to assist in the day-to-day -day operations and delegating responsibilities. I think the delegation of responsibilities to a position which, combined with the other responsibilities that this individual has, is in excess of $200,000 is difficult for me to support. I, I in good, good conscience, cannot support um, paying an individual in excess of $200,000 a year to perform functions for the town of North Reading. And again, it's not the chief's fault or responsibilities here. And, and, and again, as far as, you know, what his salary is and what the salary was established initially, we've gone over that uh, numerous times. Um, but I think we have uh, a responsibility to ensure that for the size of the, our community that we appropriately pay people for the positions and the responsibilities that, that they're responsible for. But we also have to keep it in check and also uh, keep in mind that, again, if we need additional resources, human resources, then we make the pitch to town meeting for that. Um, but I think there comes a point in time where we have to draw the line as to what the value of any position in this community is. And at some point, people have to make a determination as to whether or not they want to continue to work here for whatever the pay is, you know, or if they're looking for other opportunities at a higher wage, there are other places to go, larger communities that can afford it. I just can't in good conscience support um, putting this all into one position uh, that again puts a salary in excess of two hundred thousand dollars. One just clarification, please, uh, for uh, town administrator. We're not putting this into one position. This is a separate position in the sense that if we were to lose our police chief, the new police chief would not automatically be the public safety director. Correct. So, the the position the position exists as a separate position in the budget. So if you yes. look, there's a fiscal year 2019 request for public safety administration with public safety director, personal services. Um, the incumbent who has a position is both a police chief and has those additional responsibilities assigned to them uh, and is compensated a, a stipend for that. That's effectively how it's been implemented. Should there be a change in that position, we'll evaluate what the appropriate structure is and what the need is. And that's no different than anything that we've done in any other position that's come in, in my time here at least. Uh, nor is it any different than what we do with the budget from year to year when we look at what the budgetary needs of a particular department are. So, you know, the, the short answer is no. It's not something that I believe that we are locked into. I think that there's a benefit to us by having some continuity in it. But um, I, I, think I, I think I was fairly upfront. I think I think I was up front with the board as to why I was recommending the course of action. It was because we had a seasoned individ individual here that could implement the position. If we didn't have that, I don't know that I would have felt that that would have been a route we could have gone down. I, I you know, again, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I. I so to your, just if I'm reading you correctly, mm -hmm. hearing you correctly, these are really two separate positions. Just right now, we happen to have a candidate that can do both. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Mrs. Minyapelli. That was, I think, when we have discussed this previously. I would love to see this as a fully funded, standalone, full-time sure. position. 
Um, but I also, you know, later on in the agenda, we're evaluating our town administrator who we ask to say, what can you tell us to do to make it better? We need to support him with these types of services and available, we did have the availability to give this the $30,000 as a part-time type of a capacity or less than a full-time capacity. I would like to see it as a full-time. And I do think it's in the charter. So I wasn't here previously when it was contemplated to, to be appointed before, but I'm glad that I was here to be able to do this. And I, I think that from what we're hearing, it's working. And I do hope it, it uncovers some additional efficiencies in terms of how the departments are managing themselves. And I think right now, especially when we last heard from the town administrator, where we're seeing a, a huge turnover, we're losing people that have been here 30 years and people that have, you know, been in service, dedicated service for a uh, number of years that I think it's, it's even more important to have this figure in place helping to direct these, these different departments. So I'm, you know, I understand where you're coming from in terms of your perspective, but I'd love to see it as a, a full-time standalone. When, and when we first discussed implementing it, we were talking about a uniformed individual serving in that capacity, and we have that person, and I think it's great that, that he's working out great in, in the position right now. Mr. Masseri. I haven't changed my mind from before. I wasn't in support of this, because I think of, of the, uh, and it's got nothing to do with the police chief. You know, I, I firmly believe that in the position that he's been put in, he can do the job. I just think we're organizationally creating a problem. If someone came to me and said, this is only a temporary position to fix some things, I could go along with it. But I view this as going down a path that we're gonna be sorry for in the future. So I haven't changed my position. It's not exactly the same as Steve's and if, uh, and I won't be putting a motion to, uh, on this article to unfund it. Well, it's pretty unfortunate that the two of you are taking that approach when you look at the amount of responsibility we laid on this town administrator and we're trying to become more efficient in getting his job done and the amount of public safety issues that mount on his desk his ability to react to all of them with the right quality of time needed I think we've heard for a little bit of it tonight how effective this is in just a short period of time I think is paying big dividends for $30,000. Uh, and I do hear you continue to say, if we need to get more resources for them, let's get more resources for them. You gotta put the money aside for this one individual and look at the big picture. We're becoming far more efficient. Even, we even heard from the finance director, but even the finance director has to, I have to assume, has seen some benefit just from the standalone, and this is not a shot against the town administrator. He's been laid with a lot of responsibility, which means he's spread thin. And his ability to respond effectively and efficiently becomes very difficult. So for her to finish her job and getting these budgets all pulled together, and you take, you saw his original organizational structure, that was massive to get amount all those budgets together and meet with every one of those individually and give them the individual time they needed to be real efficient in pulling those budgets together. I would have to assume, I don't know this for a fact, but I have to assume there had to be more efficiency in pulling those four departments together this year than we had in past years. That was just my assumption, but I would love to ask. I hate to put you on the spot, but if you wouldn't mind sharing, do you see a change in the ability of at least getting those public safety budgets pulled together and were we able to find efficiencies? Were we able to analyze things differently than we ever have before? Please. The <coughs> police chief, myself, the fire chief. Um, the fire chief, as you know, came on board January 22nd. Um, it was not his budget that he developed for FY19. So the three of us sat down and spent five hours one day going through the budget, 
and finding areas that were not necessary and we were able to bring that budget down substantially so it is working it's uh, a great great position it's not just to help the fire department it's to help the building department it's to help the board of health um, the building department has many changes that are you know coming along whether it's 104 Lowell Road or it's the implementation of a new permitting software which affects the fire department code enforcement the board of health it includes all of those departments and this has been something that we have wanted to do since I started in 2011 so there is so much that needs to get done and it's not a one-person job so you know, I, I think that there is progress being made um, and that we need to see, see that progress through. So this is a really good example. <clears throat> and you say that, you know, five hours, to take five hours of the town administrator's time to really focus, and you actually achieved, you said you, you found some savings? Close to $100,000. So I, I just <clears throat> think you're looking at this all wrong. I'm trying not to convince you change your mind, but I'm just asking you to sit back and think about it a little bit differently. I don't know if you have a personal issue with the particular individual. You gotta put it aside and look at the big picture here. There's just one example where we saved almost $100,000 of efficiencies in one department, and I have to assume the others have learned something through the process. But the biggest point I'm trying to make here is that it's five hours of the town administrator's time that allowed him to go and work on other things to continue to keep moving us forward to meet our strategic plan that we put in place. So, and I, but, and I will give you the, the floor, Mr. O'Leary, in a second, and uh, Mr. Schultz as well, but I, I have to ask this question because you, 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 know, you keep on saying that we're gonna have a problem down the road. What possible problem could we have down the road? That, uh, please, I, I need to know this because I've heard this now a couple times, but there's no substance. That was actually my question as well. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, first of all, uh, to infer that I have a problem with the individual is totally incorrect and unfortunate that it was stated. Because okay. Well, you didn't vote Nothing. for him. You didn't vote for him to begin with. Didn't so vote I for just assume. No, I, I didn't vote for the position. No. I don't support when the, the position. Was, was hired. I did. Was I don't have vote. a vote. Okay. But I so apologize. So so I didn't mean to offend no. you. I'm just saying. I, just I have the utmost respect. He's doing a fabulous job. I think he's got a terrific job, and. and uh, the utmost respect for him. Uh, I believe that, you know, first of all, I don't believe the public safety position is required or necessary to bring about these efficiencies. I mean, I look at other communities and how they operate and how well they operate. And it's not with a public safety director to help the, uh, alleviating some of the responsibilities of the town administrator on a day-to-day -day basis and doing the research and doing the analysis and and uh, assisting department heads and pulling things together. It's done with additional resources in the form of, you know, whether it be an assistant town administrator or some other administrative support, uh, which is probably more warranted, and again, I would not be opposed to, more warranted in relation to actual responsibilities and taking them off of his, his table and his plate. You know, to me, you know, the responsibility ultimately lies with the town administrator, and we don't necessarily need a public <coughs> safety director to take care of some of these efficiencies and to help coordinate an effort to bring about efficiencies. So I strongly disagree with the position of public safety director. Unnecessary. I've seen other communities operate very efficiently and very well, very effectively, you know, with additional administrative support to help coordinate things. But we're talking about permitting systems and things of that nature, uh, you know, which would more or less fall under the finance director's uh, oversight but with administrative uh, support and helping pull together and do the research and, and the analysis with it. Uh, so a again it, it's it's not it, it's the public safety director's position first of all unnecessary and I'm opposed to. Uh, secondarily again I go back to the salaries in relation to what we're paying an individual and I don't think I can in good conscience support that. Uh, but that's more, more secondary than it is uh, the public safety director's position. Uh, it's not necessary to effectuate a lot of these changes and an awful lot of the uh, um, efficiencies that need to take place. I, I, again, we're growing. There's an awful lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility on the town administrator's desk that he needs some relief from. 
but I don't think he needs relief from responsibility, and I think the, uh, uh, the support can come from other administrative staff, not a public safety director. It's not, it's not a formula that's, it's been tried in other communities and stopped. But we, so we've never been a traditional community. We haven't, we've done things untraditionally here. We've, we've tried to explore new ways of doing things, and the PFA is another example. And look at the success so we're having there at the PFA, the participating yeah. funding agreement. No, I didn't. We've tried to yeah. branch out, and I'm not, Mr. O'Leary, I'm not trying to be argumentative with you, yeah. but you mentioned these other communities. I guarantee you, you go look at the organizational structures in these other communities, and they have far more administrative staff within each department than our departments have had. They don't have the resources. That's why having somebody that can give them the more quality of time to help them be more efficient for thirty thousand dollars is far more return on investment for the town than bringing in another fifty thousand dollar, another sixty thousand dollar, another eighty thousand dollar, and even bringing in, quite frankly, another hundred and eighty thousand dollar to be, be a deputy. It's it's proven to be more efficient, and I think if you give this a little more time, give it a year or two, and see the true results, and then when you have the opportunity to vote for this budget in a couple of years and you don't see the efficiencies and the return on the investment, I mean, there's 100000 right there in just a short period of time. If you don't see it, I will be the first one at town meeting to support you and saying it didn't, it failed. But don't kill it before it even got started. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I think we all agree, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, that, that we want to take some of the public safety issues off the TA's plate. I, I think we're in agreement on that. I just don't see how those types of issues can be given to somebody at an administrative level. I think you need a professional level to deal with those issues. I they also think with the police chief's current salary is irrelevant to this discussion at all. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that has to do with the, the price of tea in China. It's the cost of this position is thirty thousand dollars. We're not married to it, Mr. Town Administrator. I'm assuming if this doesn't work out, we can get rid of this position tomorrow if we wanted to. Correct. So again, any, any appropriation, any, any position, any, any dollar we spend is subject to appropriation at town meeting. If we end up in a situation so we don't want to request it funded at town meeting, so we, we have it. something that's working. It's thirty thousand dollars. If it doesn't work in the future, we can defund it. Why are we even arguing about this? I, I don't get it. One more thing, and then we're going to get to the public hearing. Okay, Mrs. Minipel. If you located a hundred thousand and we have thirty, why can't we do a hundred and thirty thousand dollars standalone position? We'll get to that. Um, 100000 is needed for the FY19 operating budget. And I, I also, I, I agree with my colleagues that because it's, it's a elevated appointment, cloaking it with that authority is what mean, means and makes the difference versus just an administrative lateral colleague looking into sort of these kind of management duties. Because it's an appointment and because it's as a directorship, that's what gives that, that position the authority to be able to peel back these things in these different departments and ha give, gives that appointment the oversight. So I, I think it's important and I also think it's not necessarily giving our TA free time or extra time or you know, taking things off of his plate. I, I, he's then directing his focus to other things that he's trying to get done or maybe get things done more quickly. So um, I think it's great. I think we need to support him when he asks us for things like this, just like he asked for the um, human resources director. This is something he proposed to us. We've heard that it's working. So I think it's important to support him when he comes to us and tells us, here's a need that I have. Help me do my job by implementing this. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to the moment. Yo, oh, sorry. Please, don't. Mr. Kelleher. I guess my, my view I, I, of this, and I take it from my experience in business, is that you've got a CEO of this community effectively, and you guys are the board of directors, and you've charged him with certain responsibilities and expect him to get things done. I think he deserves a little leeway here. If it doesn't work, it's a reflection on him and his, and his managerial skills. If it does work, he gets a lot of praise for it, but I, uh, I, I think you got to let, as you said, you got to let, you got to let it try it and see whether it works or not. I've got a lot of respect for for, for Michael. Uh, if this is how he wants to run 
the administration of the town that he's charged with, with uh, caring for, then I think he deserves the support of, of this group to, to get that done. If, he, if he's successful at it, wonderful. And if he isn't, then he's got to, he's got to deal with that. Well said, thank you. Is there any other comments or participation in this? If not, we're going to go to the next agenda item, which is, sorry, Mr. Yule. Oh, Mr. Yule, please to the podium or to the seat here, whatever you prefer, you're more comfortable. Just state your name. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff Yule, 427. Uh, Park Street. Uh, with this position, it's thirty thousand dollars a year, uh, and I'm guessing that as long as the current chief is in that position, um, that this new position here will go with him or stay with him. But when the uh, current chief retires, and you mentioned about the standalone. Uh, uh, employee for this position. Do you have an idea by itself as a standalone what it would really cost to have this position uh, going forward? Assuming that the responsibilities would have to be separated from the current, uh, from the new, ch new chief. If you don't have that person that is capable as, as the quality of the chief that we have uh, can fill that position. So what would it cost to maintain a standalone position as described here? Excuse me, I, I think the slide, okay, yeah. please. Can we move a slide that actually speaks to that? When we were considering the options um, for implementation, up top here, a full-time standalone director of public safety, you know, okay. just based on the salary structure here in North Reading, the uh, so-called going rates for public safety professionals and you know mostly in police and fire but um, when you when you look around and look at how it would fit in you know our rough estimation was you're looking at really 140 to 190 thousand dollars when you include the cost of the benefits okay. so so therefore looking in the future we're looking at an addition to the budget of approximately uh, those numbers so. Nobody agreed with me as a standalone. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. I just just want to. Uh, I know Steve um, Selectman O'Leary has questions about the impact it's going to have on the future. I was looking at it strictly from a dollar perspective, because um, of all these things. The program uh, it sounds like a very good program to me, and things that need to be done. Okay, but I'm looking at financially for the town and for the taxpayer that. We're possibly looking at an additional hundred and forty thousand dollars when if we have to fill this position. So that's that's Thank my you, question. Mr. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We're going to go into the FY two thousand nineteen operating budget informational hearing. Mr. Chairman, um, we have a hearing notice which we in order to make things difficult for Selectman Schultz, didn't provide him a copy of. I'm happy to read it if uh, you oh, like. Oh, please do. Yes. <laughs> do you need the light on? Oh, you're young. You don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll read it briefly, and then I'll give you the good news. Town of North Reading, notice a budget informational hearing. The North Reading Board of Selectmen does hereby notify the residents of the Town of North Reading that an informational hearing on the fiscal year... 2019 budget contained in the annual warrant will be held Monday, April 23rd, 2018 at 8.45 p.m. in room 14 of Town Hall. Interested residents will be given the opportunity to be heard. Submitted by the Board of Select. Um, the good news, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, perhaps I was a bit aggressive in the timeline in trying to make sure things were in order before my uh, absence a couple of weeks ago, so we scheduled this informational hearing. Um, but we're not in a position at this point uh, to go through the extensive uh, presentation for a couple of reasons. First, we, we haven't had our, uh, we have an upcoming financial planning team meeting this Thursday, which we'll be attending. Second, out of deference to the school committee, they've not voted on their final budget, which they won't do until next Monday, as I look to the finance director, I believe. I believe so. Um, so I, I think it would be premature for us to finalize things with the budget. So I'm going to ask the board to continue the hearing to our next meeting, which is May 7th, um, in order that we may conclude our effort to, um, 
there and go through the detailed presentation that we annually provide the board on the whole budget, including the operating budgets here into out of town hall, the school department budget, and our fixed costs. Uh, that said, we do have information we'd like to review uh, in the form of an update that the finance director has put together, and it's mostly aimed at our recommendations for reconciling the town hall's budget um, based on available revenue from the revenue uh, plan um, as was reviewed with the board at the last meeting three weeks ago. So we would like to conduct that, um, that exercise. Um, and I'll ask uh, if she's ready, the finance director, to go through uh, the presentation, and you'll see some um, ideas we have there. We, we tried to be responsive to the board's comments throughout the budget process over the past few weeks um, in light of where things stand. Um, we were aware of a, of a problem which became a bigger problem, meaning the solid waste uh, contract, uh, which was out to bid uh, through DPW, which we'll speak to here as well. Um, but uh, I think what I would encourage you to do is look at this as a, a recommendation based on what's going on in the revenue plan. The document that we submitted in the big binder back in February and making these potential alterations to it in order to balance the budget come June town meeting. And with that, I'll turn it over to my director. As the town administrator mentioned, um, what we're presenting this evening is what you um, saw in the revenue plan a few weeks ago uh, prior to our last uh, financial planning meeting as well. This budget and revenue plan um, has not been updated to reflect the um, house numbers. This is the governor's uh, budget figures. The house numbers have changed slightly um, with, with mainly with chapter 70, but when I say slightly, it's, it's not a huge number. And then the offset uh, for the increase in chapter 70 revenue that we received they then increased our state and county charges. Um, so it really is not, not a substantial amount to, to our revenue plan. I believe it's uh, between 15 and 16,000 net uh, that makes a difference. So what you see is the revenue plan from three weeks ago. Um, this is no different than we go through um, every year. You, we have our tax levy, we have new growth, um, and in the new growth number of 508, we have um, 104 Lowell Road, which um, included a slight adjustment of about $43,000. So we had been carrying $90,000 for new growth on 104 Lowell Road, and we increased that about $43,000. We have debt exclusion. This is made up of the high school, middle school project and prior uh, debt excluded pro pro projects, the police station and other various school projects. Um, we have unrestricted state aid, Chapter 70 state aid, and um, reimbursement from SBAB, which is now MSBA. Um, <clears throat> and this is an annual payment that we receive. Rather, now they um, do a reimbursement-based yeah. program. Local receipts, uh, this is made up of various sources. This includes the trash fee, motor vehicle excise, um, investment income, it's a whole slew of things, uh, meals tax, municipal Medicaid, uh, license and permits, uh, fees and forfeitures, a whole various slew of um, items in that figure. This figure grew um, with the uh, initial discussion of investing the proceeds from 104 Lowell Road, um, where we can invest in a CD in upwards of 2%. Um, of an interest rate, so we increased our investment income from $10,000 to $260,000 to represent um, investing $15 million in a CD. Other financing, other financing sources is made up of transfers from various um, stabilization funds, um, water indirect costs, parks and rec indirect costs, um, cell tower revenue, there's a whole whole bunch of transfer, transfers. Then we come down to the breakdown of the budget. We have fixed costs, and then we have the town's budget, and we have the school's budget. Uh, the fixed costs come off the top of available revenue. The fixed costs are made up of debt service, regional school assessments, workers' comp, um, Medicare, health insurance is the, one of the largest ones. Um, Middlesex County Retirement Assessment, 
So there's, there's a mix in there as well. And then the town's reconciled level service budget. And as the town administrator mentioned, um, this does include the increase um, that we received for the sanitation uh, contract and the school's level service budget. Now this is the school's level service budget. This is not their modified level service budget. So I'm just using the level service figure. We both still have budget gaps at this time, as you can see. Um, the next slide, we will go through some budget adjustments that we've done on the town side. And I will speak to um, some ways in which we can address the increase uh, in the sanitation budget. The sanitation budget increased substantially over <coughs> FY18. Um, and I can also let the acting DPW director speak to it as well. But it is a substantial increase. What's the, um, the modified level service budget for the school department? What, do we, what would that uh, number be? Um, as of the last financial planning meeting, the modified level service budget for the school department um, is approximately 31 million 200,000 round but, numbers. No, but what does that do to the deficit? The deficit, general? obviously, it would increase it. Um, yeah, yeah and just curious as to what, the, you, what yep, the delta I can, is. I can tell you what it is. Grand. Well, it's 234 for the level service, but modified. Over half a million. Four hundred eighty-two and change. And that's yes, plus so, the two hundred thirty-four. So, yeah. so it's 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 yeah about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, I'm taking the available revenue for um, the the school <coughs> department. So it's not plus the two thirty-four. Okay. There, there. No, 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 no. I know it's included. No, so it's about two hundred fifty thousand dollars more. Yes. Yeah. Yep. The modified is about two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars more. That's what I'm, I'm yes. curious yep. about. Okay. Yep. Okay, all right, moving on to the next slide. So these are the town's FY19 budget adjustments. Um, we've gone through all of the budgets. We've had all of the budget hearings now. Um, the town administrator and myself have met with all the department heads and we then have called through every budget to see where we can um, achieve some, some savings in order to balance the budget. So the first thing um, that the town administrator is recommending cutting is the TA social media coordinator uh, professional services that he had in his budget of $10,000. The Board of Health extra nurse hours. Now this was above and beyond what is uh, regularly budgeted in the Board of Health budget. Um, police department as well as in, in the fire department when we get there, but I might as well just speak to them once. Police department and fire department Verizon data lines, now that microwave is up and running, um, they no longer need to pay those bills anymore. The police department's um, budget number for those monthly bills was about $100 higher than the fire department. I believe it was 380 versus 280 in that range per month. Um, the police department animal control, um, they've had a vacant part-time animal control position um, for a few years now, two years now, um, and the police chief, um, you know, is, is at this time al allowing it to be cut. The finance department, we had added in for FY19 um, five extra hours per week for the assistant finance director. She currently works 30 hours per week, and at this time we can't fund that, those extra hours. The fire department, as I mentioned um, in the discussion regarding the public safety director, the fire chief and the police chief and myself met and went through line by line the fire department's budget. We examined what got purchased out of it, what needed to get purchased out of it, each line. Um, and we were able to reduce uh, expenses that way. Operation salaries and overtime, this um, was not reduced by um, us doing anything. It was reduced by movement within the department. Um, as, as mentioned and as everybody is aware, um, you know, Captain Stats became Chief Stats that made a vacancy. Um, and then uh, Captain Nash retired, that also created a vacancy. 
So two firefighters moved up to be one a permanent captain and one a provisional captain, making two firefighter positions available, reducing the average overtime rate. Um, we're in the process of hiring one firefighter. The next hire fi firefighter won't be hired until FY19. Um, so that is the reduction in operation salaries and overtime. It's due to movement within the department. Um, code enforcement, admin assistant overtime. So the building inspector um, included in his budget uh, additional staff for 104 Lowell Road, part-time um, building inspector, part-time plumbing, part-time electrical, and admin overtime hours for the administrative assistant. All of those expenses were pulled out of the department's budget because they will be funded in a revolving fund from the permit revenue received from 104 Lowell Road. This was an oversight that it was left in his budget. So we're not you know, cutting a position or anything like that. It will be funded from the revolving fund, but this was left in there. Um, we are adding back in the police department clinician. The town administrator was recommending that the new position of the clinician start in January. We are able to add it back in and have it, have it begin in September. The police chief had requested that it begin in July. Um, after discussions with the finance committee as well as with your board, um, the town administrator is recommending an increase to the EDC professional services expenses to 50, from, from 5,000, so he's increasing it to um, 15,000 more for a total of 20,000, which is what um, the, the community planning director had requested was 20,000 for EDC. Um, and sanitation. So sanitation um, had a large increase to begin with within its budget. Well, after the RFP process, um, we received two and two, two bids and um, we have decided at this point to go with a one-year JRM contract extension and begin the process now for next year's um, contract with, with, with a vendor. So this is above and beyond what we had already increased the budget um, and what we had submitted to the Board of Selectmen. Um, so then, the total net budget adjustments is $268 after we've made our cuts and made our additions. So, you may be wondering why I say we still have a budget shortfall, and the reason for that is because we need to do something regarding sanitation. Whether it is a transfer from the Sanitation Stabilization Fund to directly offset the sanitation budget, or and or, I think it needs to be a combination, um, the trash fee needs to be adjusted in order to cover this. There's no other way. Um, it's a, sub a substantial increase over FY18, and I, I can, Mark is well versed in this um, if we want to discuss it. What's in the stabilization fund? 125000 I don't suggest taking all of that. I suggested to the town administrator, you know, taking a portion of that. Okay. Questions for the DPW director? What are we talking about as far as suggestions in relation to uh, trash fee increases? <clears throat> So <clears throat> we will shoot the message. Sorry. So if uh, <laughs> if 100 percent of the increase were to be applied to the trash fee, the current trash fee is 56 dollars and 50 cents a quarter. It would go up to the neighborhood of 72 or 73 dollars a quarter. It's about a 30 percent. What we're looking at, and this strictly relates to the recycling market, we're looking at about a 30 percent increase in our sanitation budget over last year due to changes. China will not take the uh, the recyclables. The market has crashed where people were getting paid for recyclable materials now, they're having to pay to get rid of them at this point. Uh, you probably followed some of, the, some of the information that's been in the news, but uh, the town of Wilmington's having a, their trash hauler is on the verge of uh, declaring 
bankruptcy just due to this issue. They're in year four of a 10-year agreement with them. Um, so long answer to your question, but it would have yeah. to go up by about 30%. Last time we raised the trash fee, it went from, uh, I believe it was $45 a quarter to the current 56.50, and that was in at the beginning of FY09. So it was, it'll be 10 years ago this year. You said you got two bids, and that's for the new contract. So we put out a request for proposals. If you remember, uh, the former director, Andrew Lafferty, was here with Ed McGrath and went through, uh, and the board made a number of suggestions, asked them to go out and look at a number of different alternatives for uh, hauling and collecting trash. And uh, we put that on the street and uh, basically had 12 basic alternatives between recycling and trash collection and uh, had just two bidders, one being our current hauler and one being another uh, trash hauler. They didn't all bid on all 12 of the items. So one of the items was to continue with the one day a week, Tuesday collection. An alternative to that was to go to a five day a week, thinking we'd get more bidders into that. Our current hauler bid on the one day a week, the other hauler bid on the five day a week. So we didn't even have apples to apples to compare to. Um, our current bidder was a little bit lower than, than the comparable or the other bidder in terms of parent, as close as we could compare services. They also, they also gave us an alternative to go with a five-year uh, buy-in with them again. We were reluctant to do that. Um, one of the alternatives we put out there was also to go to automated collection after year one. So we're too close to the start of the next fiscal year to get new carts and go to an automated collection system. We felt if we went with the, uh, the current manual collection system for year one and then went to an, uh, an automated system in year two, um, that would be an option. But uh, again, it was one bid on it, one did not bid on that. So uh, Did our current hauler do that? The, uh, uh, they're, they're willing to talk to us about it. They do not currently do that. They're, uh, they're primarily doing the, the, the old manual collection system. The automated collection system obviously makes a, uh, an investment for them up front. They have to buy machinery to be able to do that. They're not going to enter into a one-year agreement with a community to do a, an automated system because they've had to, they have to obviously spread those costs over a number of years. So the, I, I don't think the intent was to have people decide on the sanitation tonight. Um, I believe it's going to be on the next selectmen's meeting to kind of flush this out in more, yep. uh, more detail. It would be good if we could for the next meeting to sort of have a little structure broken out. You know, you talked about the $73 increase per quarter. You know, what would be your recommendation with the, sort of the combined using some of the stabilization money and then increasing the rate? And, you know, if you can give us kind of a ballpark on maybe a couple scenarios, and then we'll leave it to us to make a decision. But if we can get that information in advance of the meeting so we can just look at it and process it in our own minds individually and then collectively discuss it, would be appreciated. So we have a fairly decent package of information we could distribute to you right now. It doesn't have that last financial piece to it, but I could work with the finance director and we could come up with that couple of alternatives for you. Mr. Schultz. I just want to clarify, we haven't had an increase since fiscal year 09? It's not in the trash fee. The trash. And it would go from 56 to 73 or so? Correct. Per quarter. I mean, does it make sense to have small annual increases so we're not our residents are getting whacked all at once because I don't think 56 to 73 is really that much if you're talking about well, almost 10 years. It, it's not. It's about it's under a 3% increase per year. The and, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Liz. The current trash fee structure has generated a small amount that's gone into the stabilization fee every year as it currently stands. So that 5650 was actually covering the cost of the entire solid waste program for those 10 years. It's been a fairly stable cost program. If you look at what JRM has been charging us, long term it's been very, very stable. It's the collapse of this recycling market that's causing a huge spike this year. So I guess now, we, we could have done that and thrown more money into the stabilization fund by increasing the fee every year. But uh, it should it, it we increase the fee every year just by a small amount so we don't have these big spikes? We're going to have the same net effect to the rate payer. Uh, well, we would have, if we had done that every year and increased it, 
we would have banked a lot more into That's the right. stabilization yeah. fund over that time. A smaller increase would allow you to have obviously a lesser increase, you know, yeah. in any given year. Mr. Minupelli. I think the whole point of the, the, the fee is to cover the cost of what it's costing us on that long term agreement, though. I, I wouldn't be in favor of just randomly increasing that amount just so we can add to the stabilization coffers. I mean, it's a contract that we would put into place so we would know what the cost is long term, and that's what the fee is based on. But in terms of this one year contract and the additional extension cost, that 114, what next year following? Are we prepared for another increase? in year two and what what was the response like in terms of something more long term and what were the dollars that they were talking about in terms of the two bids that we did get the uh, the longer term agreement or a five year agreement with them would have driven the cost down per year for for the five years versus the one year increase um, nobody's really comfortable saying what the costs are going to be going into the future because uh, Nobody knows what the market's going to do. One of the things we did include in the bid was a recycling processing fee where we actually asked the bidders, tell us how this would work. You know, come up with a formulation where if the market starts making you money, we, we stop paying so much for recycling and you start paying us back. Or if the market goes the other way. It was a built-in safety factor so that it protected the town's interest to some degree and protected their interest to some degree. I, I'll share the numbers that I have with you for, for the next meeting. Um, Thank you. Anything else? I, I'll just yes. add one more thing. So the, the one other factor that we don't know is if we're looking to go to the automated collection a year from now, um, that was a big unknown in the bid as well. And there was a third party that their bid consisted of, we're not going to quote on this because you're not being definitive about where you're going to be if you're going to be automated a year from now. They wanted more... Uh, more structure to it. You know, we tried to bid it so we had as many options to go as many in the best interest of the town as we could. And uh, some of the some of the people out there apparently aren't that comfortable with that. They want to know, no, beginning July 1st next year, you're going to have the automated system in, and then for the next five years of that contract, we'll deal with you under an automated system. So it's it's a market that's in flux right now. So uh, don't throw your money into it. Thank you for all your work on that. Mr. Yule, if you wouldn't mind. It's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I should repeat, Jeff Yule, 427 Park Street. Uh, I too have been following the, um, uh, what's been going on in China, the recycling uh, issues, uh, and they're not taking much trash from us. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. But, <laughs> uh, but the, is this a, a good time for to begin dialogue to begin to roll the trash fee into our taxes so it become tax deductible the numbers now beginning becoming higher than it's than it's ever been uh, seventy eight dollars may not be a lot of money but to some people it is but rolling it into the tax as a deduction so that conversation this might be a good impetus to have that com conversation um, we're on a one-year contract, and that's an increase, correct? Uh, that's why it's in addition. That's in addition to the submitted FY19 budget increase. Right, so okay. So this is a over and above what was submitted for FY19, which was already a 25% increase. Right, okay. So in the negotiations you're having, if you mentioned a five-year contract, are they interested in doing that at this time? Because that would not seem to be to their advantage uh, to have a five-year contract when, when the cost may escalate significantly. Are, are we in a, in a position where they're going to be forcing us to have maybe a one, two, or three at the max uh, contract because of the, what's going on uh, in the industry? And is JRM interested in a five-year contract as it is. So our conversation with JRM, they are interested in continuing doing business with the town of North Reading. We've been doing business with them for a number of years. Um, again, we tried to provide them some protection by allowing them in their bid to include a formulation based on 
the market for recycling to ha have a fair cost in there for recycling. So if they know they're not going to be losing, and apparently they're losing a lot of money this year because they're raising this cost this much, we've had a number of conversations trying to pin them down and, and, and tell us where the money's going. But it, it, and you can find it in, in the news, as you mentioned, Jeff, that the market's crashed and people are, are losing a lot of money. If they're, if they're guaranteed to make money, yeah, they want to sell, they want to take in more trash or do more collection than, than they do because they can spread their costs over, you know, a greater, greater uh, base and, you know, therefore make, I don't want to, more profit, I guess, would be the... Yeah, well, they, they would need to do that. I guess, I think trash collection costs are going to increase dramatically even going forward from this point on for the next five to ten years unless China uh, changes their uh, approach right now. But it's going to be a big cost to us um, at, you know, going forward. So There's no doubt about it, and that's why I think we'll get the information over the week, over the next few weeks. We'll be discussing this in more length at our next meeting, and we'll be in a position to have to make a decision. But everyone does understand Every, con every community throughout the Commonwealth knows that this is a big issue. It's impacting everyone, not just uh, unique to North Reading. Thank so you. Any, thank you, Mr. Yule. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. O'Leary. Just in relation to the putting it into the tax bill uh, question, comment, based upon the new tax law, for those people who are just above the average assessed valuation and happen to have a job, do you absolutely no good no because good. it's going to be capped at ten thousand dollars combination of state income taxes and real estate taxes for those people that have uh, smaller homes and uh, low real estate taxes and low income they're probably not going to itemize so it won't do them any good either at this point we live in the wrong coasts of the country and, yep. and, techni and technically in just to add state. to that it, yeah, it isn't state. actually a tax that we can just slide or roll into the real estate taxes it's a fee and I think we also have other regulations that prohibit us from just adding things into. Well, the this was originally taxes. this was originally in the tax bill, and uh, years ago when we implemented the old, for those that have been around a while, the orange stickers, that was the first. Lush had tried to get it out of the tax roll, where uh, the tax bills, the tax bills were subsidizing the trash pickup, and then we got away with it and took it all out of the uh, tax bill and made it a self-sustaining fee-based system. So originally, and in some, some communities, it still is part of the uh, services that are delivered. But again, if we do that, other services suffer. Right. So, Well, we'll discuss this more at our next meeting. Uh, no other questions. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Okay. We're going to discuss the MWOA, MWRA Andover Water and Wastewater. Mr. Chairman, through you, we have a yes. presentation on, I say we, but I did very little. <laughs> so I can miss Ariel Leary, uh, Acting DBW Director Mark Clark, and uh, Rob Williamson, Mike Stein from Bright Pierce, put together a presentation uh, that will uh, take you through um, this evening okay. um, that I think puts a lot of the information kind of in one place, both in terms of uh, what's happened since last September, the technical information that's been able to be gathered uh, in that time, and uh, recommend a course of action. I'd like to just take a maybe a seven eight minute recess if we could use the facilities allow them to put their presentation together try to be as quick as we can thank you let's get started folks yes I've been gone for three weeks Just We're going to turn it over to the experts. We all set, Michael? We're ready. Okay. Maybe. Let's roll. Maybe. So uh, we're going to start with just a single slide uh, itemizing the current status. And then Wright Pass is going to go through and present their uh, technical okay. findings that we've asked them to do leading up to the eventual filing of the FEIR. So. The status is as follows. 
uh, and hand over the 99 year legislative request has been approved by the town meeting special town meeting second one right Pierce engineering study second is right. <laughs> complete <laughs> and North Reading home rule petition regarding Andover has been submitted to the legislature on the MWRA side right Pierce engineering study is again complete North Reading home rule petitions regarding Reading submitted that's related to uh, shuttling the water through Reading and having uh, uh, being a, agreeing to pay a, f a shuttling fee and then previously completed the right Pierce water engineering study in the North Reading Home Rule petition to join MWRA, they were approved by the state back a while ago. With that, I'll introduce Rob right this. Okay. Thank you. Is that coming through all right? All right, okay. Um, yeah, my name is Rob Williamson. Um, most of you know me. I'm your project manager uh, from Wright Pierce. Um, so tonight, myself and Mike, Michael Stein um, are going to talk about some of the results from primarily the water system evaluation of Andover system that you asked us to take a look at. And then Mike's going to talk a little bit about some of the wastewater alternatives that we were also tasked uh, with. Uh, so I'm going to talk primarily about the water stuff um, and in regard to Andover's water system. I'm going to tell you a little bit about their source their treatment system, their distribution system. Um, they're going to go a little bit into uh, infrastructure improvements that North Reading might want to consider to make that were um, part of the master plan that was done years ago that are kind of um, required for both, no matter which way you go, and over MWRA. And like I said, Michael will talk about uh, the wastewater stuff. Okay, thank you. So in terms of Andover, um, I want to talk about first their source. So their source is primarily generated, uh, they pull water from what's called Haggett's Pond. They have a treatment plant right on the southern end of the pond, and the, the, there's a deep hole right here. Uh, it, it's, a, it's quite a small uh, body of water. They have about six to seven days worth of storage there in a safe yield of about 1.1 MGD. Just a fraction of what their maximum day demands are, which can approach um, 12 to 14 MGD. So they supplement Haggett's Pond with water from Fish Brook and the Merrimack River. So let me talk a little bit about those. So from the Merrimack River and Fish Brook, they have a pump station that pumps over to Haggett's Pond. Um, what's important about the Merrimack River is although Haggett's Pond is a very small water body, small source, uh, the Merrimack River is virtually a limitless supply of water. Um, it has a watershed of over 5,000 square miles. Uh, it starts way up in Franklin, New Hampshire and, and flows out um, in Newburyport there. Uh, it's, it's a water source used by many, many communities uh, along its banks, quite a few in Massachusetts. Uh, the city of Havel right now is developing uh, withdrawal from it. So it is used extensively as a drinking water source. Uh, in terms of quantity, the river on average flows at about 3.4 million gallons every minute. That's enough to meet and exceed North Reading's demands for an entire day. Um, so when I say it's virtually a limitless quantity, it, it's, um, it is virtually limitless. It's a huge watershed. Um, the water quality from the Merrimack is, you know, somewhat typical of most big river systems. It's decent. Um, it requires treatment. Uh, but again, there's many communities using it. Now in terms of watershed, I want to point out um, this is the watershed um, that you currently withdraw from, the Ipswich River watershed. It's only 155 square miles. It's, um, it's just a fraction of what the Merrimack River is. So right there in itself, you can see the difference between the two um, and the benefit in, in quantity that you will derive if you choose to go with Andover. 
And moving on to treatment, and by the way, I'm just going to broad brush a lot of these things, and we can, we can talk about them. Uh, I'll address your questions afterwards. Um, in terms of treatment, they, they use a process, which, what I would call is conventional treatment. Um, their plant was built in the 1970s. It's been upgraded a number of times since, most recently in 2015. Uses fairly advanced um, treatment technologies. They use ozone, sand filtration. Um, the plant has an overall capacity of about 24 MGD. Uh, they don't approach that right now. They have plenty of excess capacity. Their demands, like I had said before, the peak demands are about 12 to 13 MGD. So they're only using about half of the capacity of the facility. Um, the things that you want to be concerned with is all the major process systems have sufficient redundancy. And what that means in engineering terms is you want to be able to supply the greatest demand that you're ever going to see with one of your primary process trains out of service. They have that ability in any one of their trains. So they could lose one train and still provide their maximum day demands. And that's even with the, uh, the North Reading demands as well. Um, they have full backup power for, um, capabilities, in other words. So if the, the power is lost, primary power is lost, um, they have generators there available to continue uh, producing water. So there's no no concerns there. Um, so now moving on to their, their uh, water distribution system. Just a quick overview, uh, you know, North Reading's distribution system is primarily one pressure zone, means everyone sees about the same pressure. Um, in Andover they have three pressure zones, they have a west, a central, and an east. The one that we primarily focused on was called the East High System. That is the one that serves North Reading. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Throughout their entire system, though, they have um, five storage tanks with almost 14 million gallons of storage. Um, some of the things that we found that were deficient, uh, the East High Zone is deficient in storage redundancy. And again, the East High Zone is the one that you want to be concerned with. And what that means is they have two storage tanks, a, a, one, MG, a one, MGD, one MG million gallon tank and a three million gallon tank. That same rule, if one of your primary systems is out of service, you still want to be able to supply the peak demands. Well, if they lose, if they had to take their three MGD or million gallon uh, tank out of service, there wouldn't be adequate supply capacity. What does that mean, though? They, they have pumping capacity. It would mean there'd be a loss of firefighting capacity in Andover, so that really doesn't impact you. Um, but it is something that they recognize that they're going to have to address um, in somewhat near, near term uh, to provide that, that storage redundancy. The other thing about the tanks is they were all relatively uh, older tanks. They, they're 60 to 40 to 60 years old. Just due to age, they're going to require attention, and, and, and Andover realizes that. But again, that doesn't really impact you per se. So this is real quickly an, an overview of their system um, showing the, the, the zones here. This is their west zone way over here in the green. The blue is their central, that's their primary zone where the treatment plant is located. And the red here is the east high zone and that's the one through two connections down here that feeds North Reading. I'm going to zoom into that little zone right here. Um, and again, this is the one we were primarily concerned with that because it affects you. So they, it, this is Andover system in the East High Zone. They have the two, two storage tanks at one site right here. They have uh, what's called the Bancroft Reservoir and Pump Station. That reservoir is actually connected to the central system, but the, there's a pump station that draws from that reservoir system and pumps into this system. Um, and that's, that's a 6 MGD tank, 6 million gallon um, tank. So there's plenty of storage capacities there to take care of the system. And then, as I mentioned, already North Reading has two existing connections where you receive water. Um, you've got the Main Street connection where uh, primarily most of the water comes from, and there's a the Central Street location. Right now, on a, a typical peak day for North Reading, Central Street produces about 350, 400 gallons a minute and the Main Street connection um, supplies the rest of it. Main Street is much more robust uh, in terms of its capacity. So we did, what we did with Andover's system is very similar to what we did with when we looked at Reading's system 
as far as their ability to convey water through their system. Um, we modeled it. We, we uh, obtained a hydraulic model from them that we used for the analysis. Um, we modeled it assuming that North Reading under worst case conditions would be taking 3 MGD for their own purposes on top of what Andover's demands are. And then we looked at um, two of the two stress conditions under maximum day demands for both communities and then maximum day demands plus a fire flow on you know, coincident in Andover's system. Those are in engineering water terms, those are the two stress conditions that you want to be most concerned with. And we looked at two different scenarios for pushing water into North Reading. We initially looked at splitting the flow between the Main Street connection and the Central Street connection as you operate now. And then we assumed all flow, and the second scenario was assumed all flow would come through Central Street. <coughs> um, Main Street. Uh, not Central Street, through Main Street. And Central Street was offline uh, because we wanted to see what the impact would be there. And I should add that we didn't, we didn't put in here, but uh, we met with them uh, a couple weeks ago and talked about potentially even adding a third connection there sometime in the future um, that I can talk about in a little bit. So what were the results of, of both of those um, stress conditions that we modeled? Um, under maximum day demand conditions, and that's where North Reading would be receiving 3 MGD, and Andover would be receiving their peak demands, currently I said somewhere between 12 and 13 MGD, um, you will get all the water you want. Um, the, the connection and their system is uh, more than sufficient to provide that supply of water. The only two issues, or the one issue that we saw was that at the higher demand flows coming into North Reading at the 3MGD, the, the, the feed coming down Main Street, that pipeline, the water velocity in that pipe is going to be high by engineering standards. Um, typically we like to see velocities in the pipe something less than two feet per second. With the Main Street thrown at, uh, flown at 3 MGD, we were seeing anywhere from four, five, even perhaps up to six feet per section, second in the main. What does that mean to you? When there's higher velocities in a pipe, you run the risk of essentially scouring the pipe of sedi natural sediment that falls out from the water and you create dirty water. Um, that's the biggest risk to you. However, we don't think that's a, a tremendous risk because Mark has flowed that um, connection. We've done tests on it. He did a test on it last fall, I believe. Flowed two plus MGD through it. Um, had no dirty water conditions at all. Um, so the likelihood of, of that sort of thing surfacing are, are small, it, it would appear. So it's not a big concern. But um, from an engineering perspective, that main right now through main, down Main Street is a 12-inch main that really should be a 16-inch main, um, if not larger. Then we looked at the maximum day demands plus a fire flow in Andover system in the east, the east high zone that I talked about. Now again, under that condition, so this is the worst case condition. This is when the most water that a system is ever expected to see is going to happen. The good thing is, in that case, North Threading is still going to get their 3 MGD. It's not going to affect you whatsoever. What it will do is it's going to affect Andover. They will not get the fire flows that they need in their system. Um, we modeled fire flows up to 3,500 gallons a minute, which is the highest required fire flow that a system is um, required to provide for large commercial um, businesses and the like, and they are in that east zone. Um, and they're not going to get those sort of flows. They may get 2,000 gallons a minute fire flow while everyone else is getting their maximum day demands. So that's an issue for them. Um, we presented to, that to them. They concur. They realize it's a problem on their side of the, of the line. Um, but again, it does not impact North Reading. Um, so those were the, 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 uh, the supply treatment and the distribution system, real broad brush, those were our findings. Um, in our opinion, things look, they look good for North Reading. Wanted to point out um, for infrastructure that's needed, um, prior we did the analysis for MWRA, there was quite a bit of infrastructure needed in the town of Reading in addition to what was required in North Reading. 
Infrastructure requirements, if you were to connect to Andover, um, what would be required are two rechlorination facilities located at the two um, interconnection points, both at Central Street and at Main Street. What happens um, is that the chlorine residual that Andover feeds, by the time it gets to North Reading, is in some cases it's low to almost zero. So what North Reading's gonna need to do is reboost those chlorination levels to provide the proper disinfection. That's done right now by the treatment facilities, the three treatment facilities that you, or two treatment facilities that are running across um, North Reading. Ultimately, when you connect with either MWRA, and, and MWRA or Andover, you're gonna be abandoning those treatment facilities, so you're gonna to need to provide rechlorination facilities. And then other upgrades that will be required within Andover's system, and this is true for both MWRA, MWRA or Andover, is uh, the several water main uh, replacement projects that are recommended. Those were identified in the master plan that was done several years ago. Those primarily are to ensure proper firefighting needs, fire flow capacity. Um, the Tower Hill tank, uh, that is your oldest tank in the system. That's a tired tank. Uh, it needs some repairs to it and some safety upgrades. Uh, so those should be made. And then as I mentioned, um, you'll be decommissioning the existing water treatment plants and pumping stations. And that was it on the water, but I was going to turn it over to Mark. Mark was going to talk a little bit about some of the costs associated with this and then some of the <laughs> pros and cons of supplying or obtaining water from Andover or MWRA. Just go back to it before you go away, Rob. Yep. Can you go back to that last slide? So just to make sure I'm understanding this fully. So regardless, we're going to have to put a different pipe in down Main Street. No. No, you are not, you, you, on, on whose side? On your side or their side? Our side. On our side, it's recommended in order to get the, to be able to provide proper firefighting capabilities, yes, you do need one down Main Street. Yeah, similar question, what if we had a fire flow at Andover had one at the same time? Um, your, the fire flows in North Reading would be met by your storage. Okay. So these costs are not in what we're going to see next, right? They are. Uh, they are. In, yep, they are in there. And the timeline to work with the DOT, because we obviously have to work with them for the Main Street, right? You would be a yeah. long stretch? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, please continue on. Okay. Thank you. I'm here. I'm not going away, so if you have more questions. So just on the main street main that you're asking about, Mike, so the main coming in from Andover is a 12-inch main. It's 12-inch 12, 12 main down as far as Burroughs Road, um, and then it reduces down to North Street, then it bumps back up to 12-inch. So there's a piece there that would need to be replaced. There's some pieces further south on Main Street that are also smaller main that would be need to be replaced as well. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the cost comparison here, so we wanted to show you just uh, where we are uh, both ends. Consulting expenses, MWRA 1.65 million versus 325,000 that was approved last uh, October for the Andover. Um, obviously the construction of the Reading or Andover, into, in, the construction in other towns. In this case, Andover is responsible for any infrastructure improvements in Andover required by this. Uh, we were required to do $4.67 million worth of improvements in the town of Reading if we went to the MWRA. Uh, as we've said, Andover's water is at a higher pressure than us. We open the valve that flows in. We don't have to pump the water from Andover. So there's no need for pumping station, uh, pumping station construction, about $2.55 million to go to the MWRA. Uh, and that includes, we, we are including not the addition of chlorine, but chloramines in that system to uh, further provide disinfection into North Reading. Um, the only difference being that the MWRA system is a system that has what's called chloramines, which is a mixture of chlorine and ammonia versus the Andover system. In North Reading's current system, we both add straight chlorine to the system. Uh, so we're showing the cost of the booster uh, chlorination stations that Rob talked about at about 1.15 million. 
Uh, the improvements needed to North Reddings was a million dollars. To our piping, if we went to MWRA, we're estimating it's about 2.5 million if we go with the Andover. That includes those improvements shown on the prior slide. Um, reimbursement for money spent to MWRA is if we go to Andover, Andover did agree in, in that uh, vote they took a couple weeks ago to reimburse us over 10 years, that $953,000. So the totals, uh, construction type cost going to MWRA is about $9.87 million. Going to Andover is about just over $3 million. Uh, we factor in the mass work grants of $3 million that we got either way, uh, and then add in the buy-in cost for the MWRA, which does not exist on the Andover side. Net cost to go to Andover is about $14.55 million. Net cost to go to Andover is $22,000. And what's not shown in here is obviously we bought the property on Mill Street for uh, $700,000 a, a year or so ago. Um, at some point, we could decide to dispose of that if we go the Andover route, too. So there's another slight pool of money there. Uh, in terms of operating costs, we have the two options again, so the pumping station plus chlorine or the chlorine distribution. We don't have exact annual operating costs. There will be very similar costs either way we go, so that's kind of a, a wash in either system. What are we going to save by going either way? We're not going to have to maintain our wells anymore. Uh, that includes the, the physical work we have to do just to keep the wells running every year, the chemical costs, the electrical costs. Uh, the you know the the pumping costs the, the some of the uh, testing costs would go away so we're estimating just over two hundred thousand dollars we'd save on that end annually and then we're estimating that we would uh, require fewer people we're still going to have a water department for the meter reading for the maintenance of the distribution <coughs> system but we'll lose uh, about one hundred eighty seven thousand in, in labor cost as well. Before you go, can you go back to that next slide, that one? So the water coming from Andover, is it a really, is it hard water? It's not, it's neither hard nor soft is the way it's defined. It's, it's called, if you looked at it, technically it'd be to, called moderately hard, um, but it's not, it's not what would be classified as hard water. Is there a capital improvement that we would want to consider to make it a little softer for improving for quality? Uh, better for how based on the for. levels of the hardness, it's not something that would be recommended. To, we don't need to soften the water. It's not something that's aggressive. Uh, it's not something that's, uh, you go out to the Midwest or even out in the West and there's some very, what they call very hard yeah. waters. Um, that's not typically the case in New England and it's not the I case. I only brought it because that maybe some mm -hmm. issues with some of our town buildings with some of the pipes. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe some of it was related to hard water. But what is hard water versus? So hard water is generally water that's hard. It has higher levels of calcium and manganese in it, and they tend to, what you'll see even in the, out in the west is they'll actually deposit some of that material inside the pipe. Hard water makes it, uh, it makes it hard for soap to work up a lather. It tends to be, you look at your washing machines or your dishwashers, typically if they're uh, above a certain hardness level, they, they recommend that you do something to the water. You can have in-house treatment systems that take some of that calcium appliances. things yeah. out of the water, yeah. But okay. it, it's generally not a problem here in the Northeast. Okay, thank you. Please continue. So here's a, we've seen this graph before. Um, cost of water operations, we're projecting it out over about the next 40 years. Um, and again, the red line is the MWRA, the blue line is North Red, uh, is going with Andover. Um, again, what's the big driver and the difference between the two lines as you go out is what is the escalating cost of the cost of water. For this, we've projected MWRA at the 4% that ha it has historically been and the 4% that they project it to be. In Andover, even though our Andover increases have been much less than this, they've averaged about 1.2% over the years. Uh, Andover's made statements that you know they're they're looking at 2.5 percent being more the norm going forward. So, what tends to happen in that is the further out you go, 4 percent compounded annually versus 2.5 percent, the line split fairly quickly. And you know by the end of it, you're up at uh, sorry. You know here you're up around 14 million dollars a year versus about nine and a half million dollars a year. So that even though they're very similar in the early years of this, as you get out in the graph. They split and there's millions of dollars difference in a typical year. Again, 
it's assuming that there's a constant rate of uh, growth over all that time. So this we presented back in September and October, pros and cons for either, uh, just want to go through them real quickly. MWRA, the, uh, one of the big pros is it's a, what we've always said, it's a permanent solution. That was the driving thing. That's why we asked Andover to go back to their town meeting and take that second vote. Uh, we become actual seats on the MWRA board, so we have a vote about water rates if we go to the MWRA. The community is always already well informed of this. They've already uh, supported this. We had uh, votes going back to last June for those construction monies that the, the town supported. Um, we have a design that's well underway. We've, as we said, we purchased the Mill Street property, and then we've appropriated money for construction. Pros on the Andover side are there are two existing interconnections between Andover and North Reading. There are two connections we use pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, there's no pumping costs required. The Andover system's at a higher pressure than us, so all we need to do is open the valves further and more water comes into North Reading. Um, the term sheet we worked out with Andover was any improvements needed on the Andover side will be funded by Andover. There's no buy-in cost. We avoid the uh, MWRA buy-in cost. Uh, there's no wheeling cost through the town of Reading. Again, the lower historic in, uh, water rate increases. And it also uh, supports connection to the Lawrence Sanitary District, Greater so Lawrence. Lawrence. Um, go back on that last one, thanks. So when you say they're gonna be funded by Andover, it's not 100% true because the way it was presented at their town meeting was we would pick up one third of those costs through our rate, right? So currently that is correct, yes. Yeah. So currently we support about one third of their water rates. Their water rates support their capital, um, just like our water rates right. support our capital. So technically, unless they voted to do some other funding source, if they fund their improvements through their water rates, technically we likely will be paying that yeah, I, percentage. I just think probably just better to present it that way than say yep. Andover's picking it up. I think we just say they're going to use the traditional method of, you know, they're going to pick it up, their residents are paying two-thirds of it, we're going to be paying one-third of it yeah, through no, the rate. That's a, a good and valid point. Michael, there was a rough number of about 20% of what we pay is for them to produce and get the water to us, mm -hmm. and the rest is supplementing their water rate. Yep. Mr. Schultz. Mark, so a question. Because uh, that part does trouble me a little bit, where I'm not sure if the 2.5% the, the is, is a real number. If they decide 20 years into this they want to do a major overhaul, we have no say at the table, correct? Correct. So they just do it and then pass it on to their, into their billing? Yes, correct. but the controlling factor is the fact that that impacts their water rate. Right. There. But, so, but they could do a big infrastructure improvement knowing hey North Reading is paying for a third of this we're going to do the Taj Mahal instead of do this one and there's nothing we can do about that no but well, they, that water rate increase hits all of their <laughs> citizens so yeah I mean, right but, if, but they know they're, they're only paying two-thirds for everything to do for their citizens I don't know it's a red flag to me I, I, so uh, it, 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 just keep in mind too that the rate structure that we have uh, agreed upon already is that we would be 95 percent of their lowest tier um, rate payer, right? You know, so yes, we would be paying for you know thirty percent of the, the infrastructure infrastructure costs as we would be as we have been now or more this particular juncture. Um, but by the same token, you know, they have to answer to their residents and their water rate payers, and and generally speaking, they've been pretty stingy up there. Complain Except very loudly. Except uh, the they former selectman who wanted higher rates. Oh yes, I, I, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Mindypelli, I will get to you in a second, but I I just want to say that I think it's a actually a positive I think it's a deterrent from them to actually take on a significant capital cost all in one year or maybe in two years where I believe which they presented at their own time meeting they have a plan for the capital which is a pretty steady investment rather than a huge load up I mean it have to be a catastrophic issue I think and uh, I don't think they want to <coughs> handcuff their ratepayers locally I just can't imagine. I think it's a low risk situation, but you're not wrong in what you're saying. But it's well, just can't. the lack of a seat at the table is troubling. Um, but there's yep. no way around that. Yeah. Okay, Mrs. Minupelli. 
I just, I just wanted to go over a uh, couple of slides back, the water supply fixed cost comparison, and just ask you a few questions on it. Because you presented to the, um, to the capital improvements the five-year project summary on these. And I'm just, I'm just trying to coordinate the comparison between the two. So in terms of the um, Reading, so in terms of the overall project costs for either or, I think you did three projections for us. One was status quo, one was the total capital costs to fully connect to Andover, and then the, the third was the total capital cost to fully connect with MWRA over that period. And on what's in this five-year plan, it's saying that the project cost required to totally transition to MWRA is tw it's a total of 21723000 and the total cost to transition 100% to Andover, the project costs are $17,405,000. So there's not too much of a difference when you projected it over five years as to what we needed to, um, what we needed to pay for either or. So I'm just trying to s figure out, so for example, in this cost comparison, you're negating the booster chlorine station. It looks like a negative, but it, it's included. No, that's not a, that's a, that was meant to say it's an approximate number. Oh, he says precise on this five-year summary. The, she's oh, talking so about she's capital. Looking capital. Okay. Yeah, because I, I think a lot of the numbers that you've incorporated into this graph are, are precise on this summary. You know, for example, the $4,670,000 infrastructure, but it's missing what it would cost for the infrastructure improvements if we're to tie in totally to Andover. So... I'd have to, I, I, I don't see what you're looking at, so I'd have to just see, I don't know if you want me to come take that. And I yeah, talk sure. I just kind of, it's got a lot of my scratch, scratch marks on it, but for an example, it's saying North Reading water system improvements. If you take a look at these two, these, see these three, they're missing from this, and you're using the definitive figures on that, which I'm assuming Assuming you just weren't when definitive you for Andover, but they are definitive. This is Minupelli. Is that from the capital? Yes. And he, okay. did, an, he did an excellent five-year projection as to what it would cost to go all in on Andover or to go all in on MWRA and to stay status quo. And that's what I've been, in terms of informing my decision regarding the decision, that's what I keep referring back to in terms of there's still some significant other costs associated with going to MWRA. But uh, in just looking at that, I don't see much of a difference in terms of the capital improvements. And of course, we have that $3,000, $3 million MassWorks grant to offset it. So it sort of evens it out in terms of what we're going to have to do either or, as at least for capital or infrastructure improvements. So w what is shown on here, and I guess I'm, I'm missing a piece of what you're saying, but the, uh, sorry, what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it means it's time to go home. That's <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. Lights out, yeah. Magic, thank you. So w what's shown on here in 2019, what we're showing are the. Oh, okay, all right. You're only looking at the one year, not the projected five year costs. Well, for the, for the construction costs relative to Andover, they're all shown here in FY19. Those are already uh, previously approved or appropriated monies. The cost to Andover is basically, it's the sum of these mm -hmm. three years at the very bottom. But so we bottom. haven't utilized that, so we're still going to be, because it's appropriated, we're still going to be, that's still a cost factor to us. So if we do not go to the MWR, sorry, I'm having a problem with this. If we do not go to the MWRA, then this number goes away, this number goes away, and this number goes away. We don't spend them, even though they've been appropriate. That's what I was trying to get at. So you're negating it because of what was already appropriated for the MWRA project? Is that we're what? Set, we're, so at the very bottom, the net cost of this is 
when we add up all this column, subtract out the Mass Works grant, that's where that 14.55 million comes from. So if we go to MWRA, that's what we're on the hook for. If we go to Andover, it's the, it's the right-hand column, which when you subtract out the reimbursement from Andover and you subtract out the Mass Works grant, it becomes $22,000. I think, though, that uh, one thing is uh, that if you went with Andover, uh, the consulting cost under MWRA, some of that will be spent, if not all of it, because it's all related to the overall DEIR and all of the work that had to be done to pull us all together to get to a final FBIR. Should we use a different color pointer? No, no, no. It's so it's directly um, the key to that we're going directly to the panel. Affirmative. No. Gotcha. Please continue. If you have more questions, we can come back to it. <coughs> so those were the pros going either way. Just very quickly, the cons. Uh, MWRA has higher level of permitting required to go to the MWRA. Uh, we have that Ipswich River crossing at Mill Street that we're looking at that sound is uh, fairly complicated. Um, obviously, we had the uh, improvements, the Reading water system. The cost for those would be borne by the town of North Reading. Um, the reason for that is MWRA is not bringing the supply directly to North Reading. MWRA feed is to the south side of Reading. Then we're relying on the Reading water distribution infrastructure to come to or bring the water to North Reading. Uh, there's the wheeling charge we would have to pay to Reading based on the fact that we're drawing more water through their system. It's going to place uh, some level of stress on their system. They may have to replace pipes quicker, so they're going to be looking to, uh, you know, institute a future uh, cash to be able to pay for any improvements they need. Um, it would be a single connection at Min Mill Street. Again, we'd need to pump the water. We'll have to add the chloramines at the station. Uh, there's that buy-in cost. There's the special legislation. Uh, for that conservation land on Mill Street that we're looking to cross. Uh, cons on the Andover side is, again, we mentioned this, we will not be a member of Andover's Water Commission. That's the not having a seat at the table. It's, uh, it's as permanent as we can make it, but it's a 99-year agreement. Um, similar to the chloramines to the MWA system, we'd have to add chlorine at the entry points to our system. And then there's the special legislation we've been going through for the 99-year agreement. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mike Stein. He's going to go through uh, what they found on the, uh, the wastewater side. Thank you. Hi, as Mark said, I'm Mike Stein. I'm a project manager with uh, Wright Pierce. Excuse me. The old? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, without having a seat at the table, when you have a liaison to be able to attend uh, those meetings at Andover? Mr. Clark. Oh, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, during our discussions and negotiations with the town of Andover, they were not opposed to the idea of uh, forming an advisory committee similar to like RMLD does uh, have, and um, that'll be part of our discussion with the final negotiations with Andover if we move forward. So they, they were actually struck by the idea, thought it was a good idea to have at least annual dialogue, you know, semi-annual or annual dialogue uh, with representatives of North Reading, but maybe from their business community and other big users. So, but that was not part of the uh, foundation agreement that we had put together with them. But there was discussion there and they were amenable to it. Mr. Masini. The, the Andover uh, Water Commission is actually their board of selectmen and they meet in a formal meeting as water commissioners whether they do that 
is part of their regular board meeting or not, I don't know, but it is a public session. Thank you. It, it just as a, a matter of uh, a point that we also made uh, to some of the residents up there during the public uh, informational meetings, you know, North Reading was not looking for a seat on the commission to, to vote on, on water rates. We were looking to be treated just as any other uh, customer of Andover was going to be treated. We didn't want to be treated any differently. You know, how they um, set their rates, you know, how they uh, uh, determine what capital improvements are going to be made is entirely up to them. It's their water system. We're a customer. We want to be treated the same way. We weren't looking for anything like any other customer up there. We weren't, we're looking, we weren't looking for a seat at the table. But we were looking for meeting with them on a regular basis through an advisory type committee. Thank you. Please continue. Okay, thank you. As I said, uh, my name is Mike Stein. Stein. I'm a project manager with Wright Pierce. I'm here to talk about wastewater and the evaluation that, that, that we performed. <coughs> but before I begin, I just want to talk about the components of, of a wastewater system. There, there's four components to a wastewater system. The uh, user, the collection system, the treatment system, and then lastly, disposal. Okay, I think we can all agree in North Reading that we have users, the households and businesses that create or, or generate the wastewater. I think we can all agree that we can put in a collection system in town, pipes, manholes. We can treat that wastewater, but where North Reading is very limited, they're very limited in disposal. Keep in mind there's two different types of, of disposal. There is surface water, and land disposal. Surface water is exactly what, what it says. Disposing your uh, effluent, your treated effluent to a lake, to a river, to a stream. And then land disposal is you, instead of taking it to a river, lake, or stream, that you put it into the ground, such as some sort of surface, subsurface disposal, leach field type method. So, with, with disposal in, in North Reading, in order to have a surface water discharge is pretty much prohibited in, in this community uh, for various reasons, just for um, the lack of, of, a, of a surface water that'll provide enough dilution and also uh, impaired water waterways as well. So this probably several years ago, the town decided to do a study to try to find um, land disposal areas, suitable land disposal areas within the town. And one was located, a favorable site was located, but it was certainly limited, it would not accommodate all the required flow that was going to be generated. And that was, that site was the JT Berry site. And uh, since then, the, the town has sold that site, which um, creates, which that, that opportunity no, no longer exists, which further limits disposal opportunities within the town of North Reading. So with those limits, started to look at, at the uh, other options. One is taking flow to the MWRA, uh, and that would be through, through the town of Reading in the Woburn where the MWA interceptor is located. Uh, for that, we're talking 0.1 MGD or basically 100,000 gallons. That's the most that MWRA would be willing to um, entertain at accepting flow. And second is flow to GLSD, Greater Lawrence Sanitary District, which is located in uh, North Andover. In order to get there, the flow would go through Andover and then in, into Lawrence, and we're talking 0.5 MGD or, or 500,000 gallons. So by going to the MWRA or going to GLSD, um, remember I talked about the four components of a wastewater system. So by going to MWRA or GLSD, that's where the treatment and the disposal will take place. So the only thing in North Reading would be the users, 
businesses and households that generate the wastewater, and then the collection system or the conveyance system to get it to, to, to the treatment site. And then um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the findings that, um, about sending wastewater through Reading and Woburn and also through Andover and Lawrence, and I'll talk about costs. Wrong direction. Okay, th this is a map of the North Reading sewer. This is taken out of the draft environmental impact report. Uh, this has the, the top four priority areas. It has uh, Route 28 from the Andover town line going down to the Park Street intersection. It has Martin's Pond, it has Lowell Road, it has Park Street and also Concord Street. All this flow here accounts for 500,000 gallons, which would be ended up being pumped up into Andover and then flowing through Lawrence, the GLSD. So this is a map of, of Reading going into Woburn. This, this is the route that the uh, wastewater flow, the, the uh, flow path would take um, coming from Concord Street going to MWRA. So it would be pumped to a collection, to the existing collection system on Grove Street in, in Reading. And from there, you can see through the colors how, how it, it just snakes through town, ends up crossing the uh, Reading Woburn town line to connect up to the MWRA interceptor. This map here shows the flow path to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. From, from the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the uh, force main from, from North Reading. Uh, we have that going into Andover quite a bit just to bypass some existing pump stations, so we don't have to, up to upgrade those to connect up into their interceptor. And you can see how that um, more or less snakes through the, the middle of Andover going towards uh, the, uh, the uh, right-hand side of, of the screen over to the Lawrence Town Line where it goes into a pump station, the Shawshank Pump Station where it gets pumped up to the interceptor in Lawrence and flows gravity to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. So here are some Preliminary planning level costs. The, uh, the uh, top table is, is Concord Street, the, the 100,000 gallons a day going to MWRA. We're given cost ranges. Infrastructure within North Reading, this would be along Concord Street corridor, is from 7 million to 11 million. Infrastructure upgrades within Reading and Woburn in order to handle the increased flow from Concord Street ranges from 11 million to 16 million for a total cost between 18 and 27 million. The table below talks about the, um, the flow going to Greater Lawrence Sanitary District, the 500,000 gallons. The infrastructure within North Reading will be 92 million to 139 million. And that's, that's the uh, infrastructure that I showed you uh, on the map three slides ago. Um, did this map here for, for those four, four priority areas. And then the infrastructure upgrade within Andover is, is 25 to, to 38 million. Again, that's just to improve the, the, uh, the capacity in order to handle the flow <coughs> from North Reading. And that that total cost ranges from 117 to 177 million. So let's talk about the uh, the uh, wastewater pros and cons. We'll start out with, with the pros, going to the M MW MWRA, the 100,000 gallons to the MWRA, or the 500,000 gallons to to uh, GLSD through Andover. So if we went to the MWRA, that would certainly solve the Concord Street 
putting sewers in, in, in the Concord Street. Mm -hmm. um, going to GLSD through, through Andover, you would meet the North Reading's economic needs and, and identified public health needs. Uh, for example, public health needs would be around the uh, Martin's Pond area. It would also allow North Reading to phase in the sewer. For example, um, with the way that sewer is laid out with those priority areas, the first phase would easily be the uh, Route 28 corridor. And then from there, you, you can branch off on different phases and do Martin's Pond or, or Lowell Road or uh, Park Street, Concord Street. And the good news is that Greater Lawrence Sanitary, Sanitary District does have ac excess capacity in order to um, take the additional flow that North Reading would be sending. So let's look at, at the cons between going to MWRA and to Greater Lawrence Sanitary District through Andover. With MWRA, it requires investment in upgrades outside of town. But also, that's the same for going through Andover, okay? That will require investment upgrades outside of North Reading, too. MWRA will require a four to one inflow reduction for every gallon of wastewater that, that we send to MWRA, we have to take four gallons of inflow out. So if, you send, if we send 100,000 gallons to MWRA, we have to take 400,000 of gallons of inflow out in some neighboring community. And the same way in Andover. The, the difference between MWRA and Andover is that in Andover, instead of being um, 400,000 gallons of inflow reduction, because we're sending 500,000 gallons through Andover, it'd be four times 500,000. So it'd be two million gallons of inflow would have to take out of, of a neighboring community. The MWRA will only serve Concord Street. It cannot be expanded. Uh, MWRA will not entertain um, any more than, than 100,000 gallons. Also with MWRA, it does not address any public health or additional economic development needs in North Reading. It'll certainly take care of of economic development with, within the Concord Street corridor, that's for sure. Um, it would require substantial additional per permitting to solve other wastewater needs. Uh, the MWRA will require three days of storage, which just will result in additional cost. So if we send 100,000 gallons a day to um, MWRA, we're gonna need 300,000 gallons of, of storage. And Lastly, with MWRA, if, if North Reading doesn't buy water from MWRA, MWRA is not going to take any wastewater from the town of North Reading. And lastly, in Andover, um, similar, if North Reading doesn't buy water from Andover, um, likely they might not take the sewer as well. In <coughs> okay. Sure. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I'll go to the rest. Mike. Okay, so we've gone through this before, and I'll go kind of quickly. The summary of the proposed handover agreement. Uh, this is a document that uh, they voted and signed off in September, and there haven't been any changes. Primarily, uh, it was up to 2.6 million gallons a day. Option after six years to get to three million gallons. Capital expenses, Andover will be responsible f for them on their side. Water rate, 95% of their tier one rate, not to exceed 2.5% for a term of 10 years. North Reading to be reimbursed for cost already incurred up to the $953,000 that you saw previously beginning in July 1 of 2018, paid over 10 years. Term, 99 years pending town meeting and legislative approval. Town meeting has been approved and uh, uh, we've already, 
we've submitted to the legislature correctly? Yep. And have they, that I was a question I didn't have an answer to. So, so we have submitted our, our uh, three pieces of legislation, um, two for Reading and one for Andover um, to Representative Jones. I don't know that they've been admitted uh, formally for legislative consideration. When I spoke with the town manager, he indicated that they would be um, looking to do so shortly, but we're looking to see what the, what, what the outcome of our discussions were this evening prior to uh, submitting. Okay. Continuing on, uh, work with North Ring to extend fees, uh, extent, to the extent feasible to be an emergency backup supply to the town of Reading with the North Reading water infrastructure. This would benefit everybody, us being in the middle. Uh, sir, service quality and quantity, Andover responsible for meeting state and federal requirements, water band supplies to be shared equally. Permitting? Michael, Michael has a point. Sure. Uh, okay. Michael Cabrera. Oh. No, oh, I'm, either, trying, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe. Okay. maybe. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Am I on the right side? You're on it. Okay. You're on it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Is that it? Okay. Cool. <coughs> Permitting slash approvals, each town responsible for their own, and over to supply engineering and administrative support to obtain permits to assist to obtain the necessary permit, permitting on their side. And that is to increase their current permit to get to the, uh, to be able to supply us the three million gallons a day. Uh, interim agreement extended rate of 5% for FY 2019. This is the current agreement we're operating on. And then 0% for FY 2020. And then beyond that, it would be 2.5% for FY 2021. And that was the uh, extension that uh, we uh, discussed as part of this agreement. And a long-term agreement is reached. Rate goes to 95% of the end over tier one rate. At the beginning of the fiscal year, the agreement is signed. <coughs> So if a long-term agreement, this is important, is reached, rate goes to 95% of Andover's Tier 1 rate at the beginning of the fiscal year of the agreement, that, that the uh, fiscal year the agreement is signed. So if we were to get a signed <coughs> agreement on June 29th or 30th, we would get credit for a reduced rate for that whole fiscal year. The long-term agreement is reached. The rate goes to 95% of Andover's Tier 1 rate at the beginning of the fiscal year. The agreement is signed. I said it three times now. <laughs> and then sewer collaboration. And now we get to the next steps. Going down the path of Andover, signed legal 99-year water agreement. Legislature 99-year approval of the interbasin transfer permit. Town meeting article approvals, and those would be those related to the capital for Andover. And it would be less than the capital that's already been approved for the MWRA. MEPA notice of project change. Final environmental impact report, which is the FEIR and design and construct chlorine control for interconnections already been discussed. The MWRA, the Interbasin Transfer Permit, very similar to getting water from Andover. Complete and file the FEIR. Reading Historic and Conservation Committee approval of the Mill Street Bridge uh, <coughs> crossing and legislative approval for the same. And that's related to uh, the cons uh, crossing the conservation land. Legislative approval for the same. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself again. Wheeling agreement uh, would have to be worked out in terms of what we would pay Andover for passing the water through their... Reading. Reading, right. Reading uh, passing their water through the, uh, their uh, water system. And design and construct pumping facility and Reading distribution system improvements. And those have been approved by town meeting. Yep. The construction hasn't started, but the money is there. 
and we've already, as discussed earlier, we've already acquired the land. So I'll let Mr. O'Leary make the recommendation. Okay, so the recommendation that we're uh, making to the, uh, to the board this evening is um, we're looking for authorization to continue negotiations for a long-term agreement with Andover. Uh, work toward finalizing the long-term agreement by Andover by May 31st. Again, the thought behind this is, you know, if we're going to make a decision and go, go this path, we need it done and done quickly and get to some finalization so that we can have time before our town meeting uh, to have the appropriate articles available to move forward. Uh, when we uh, put off the construction down in Reading, you know, we knew that we were going to lose uh, construction season and potentially increase our costs if we were going to go with MWRA. So we're looking to have a final decision by this board to go with the Andover or the MWRA by our June 4th town meeting. So what we'd like to do is uh, get authorization to continue with the negotiations for a long-term agreement to see if we can hammer out something that would be amenable to both boards uh, in this very short order so that by the time we get to our town meeting, again, we already have spaces available in the warrant uh, to address the issues, uh, we'll know which direction we're going to be taking. And, uh, Michael, may I make one yes, comment? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, with respect to a long-term agreement, you know, we've already come to an agreement on what should be in it. I think most of this is legal in terms of putting a legal document together. We're not anticipating making any changes. And I don't think Andover is either at this point. We agree on the parameters. Yeah, mm -hmm. we agreed, yeah, on, the, we agreed, we agreed on the parameters. And again, there may be some minutiae and fine details. Again, we were awaiting uh, the report from uh, Wright Pierce in relation to any capital improvements that may have need to be made in order to meet what our demands would be and whether or not uh, there was were any impediments in theirs. It doesn't appear as though there's anything that's uh, of any consequence that they would have to. So that is one issue that's off the table. I mean, for Andover, I know that they had discussion and made uh, some some commitments in relation to a minimum amount of water that uh, they would want us to purchase. Uh, again, that's still open for discussion, you know, because as we had stated before to them, MWRA has no minimum requirements, and you know, they'll sign an agreement with you whether you buy water from them now or not. But again, that's open for discussion. Other than that, I can't think of any other um, significant issues outside the parameters that we've uh, already agreed to other than legal lease and you know, putting the pen to the paper. So we'd like to get this thing um, hammered out and finalized in short order so that we can make a final decision, final, final decision um, by our June town meeting. Again, if we can't come to an agreement with Andover in the next month, I don't understand what would impede that. So let's find out now okay. if there is. So we, may have had one, we may have had one slide out of order here. The Andover water action items would be approve the formal 99-year agreement with Andover both sides by May 31st, 2000. Which is what gets to the, the, the having this agreement done. All right. Yep. Legislative approval of the 99-year agreement, obviously, we've got to move forward with that. Uh, approve of articles related to Andover on June 4th, 2018 town meeting, if we're going in that direction. Uh, filing the FEIR as it relates to going with Andover, if we make that decision, and submit a request for interbasin transfer permit for three million gallons per day. The estimated approval time is nine months. Mrs. Mignapelli, you no, I think, I mean, maybe that answered the question. I think this might have answered it because we don't, I was thinking in tandem with this, are we going to seek the, le you know, legislative approval of the home rules, but why it's sort of two different directions, so we would have to decide so they could move forward on the one. But it doesn't seem like there's any issue there or there would be any issue there to approval of a long-term 99-year agreement. Between or us and Andover? No, at no. the at legislature. No, the legislature. No, I don't think it, no. If both communities no. are in favor of doing it, I, it doesn't appear as though there'd be a And it hurdle. doesn't seem like there'd be any holdup or issue if we move forward with the MWRA to that getting approved either. So they just, is it that they're just waiting to, to for us to decide the path before they submit one or the other? Mr. Gilberto. So they're I, two I, different. 
Yeah. So a couple of things I would I would say just based on where I think we stand. Um, I, I'm not sure that we wholeheartedly agree with the strategy of holding off on Andover's part. Um, the big difference I think is that Andover has got the has received the approval of their town meeting, whereas Reading has not yet received it nor has it sought it and would not be able to do so until November, I believe. So from a timing standpoint, that that's that is a, a difference. I don't know that it needs to dictate what the outcome is, but it's just something we need to be aware of. That's all. And, and again, Reading, you know, has been very uh, upfront with us, it's basically saying, you know, make a decision which way you want to go. We're more than happy to help you. We're more than happy to uh, to, to work with you and, uh, and assist you in getting all the required uh, permits and all the rest. But you have to make a decision one way or the other before they go and and seek any approval from their town meeting and or um, request of us or allow us to go before the historical uh, district uh, historical commission or their conservation commission so they're holding off until we make a decision on MWRA or Randover that therefore protracts the timeline and that's why it's important for us to have Andover see if they can see if we can come to a final determination if that's the wishes of the board to finalize an agreement so we know what we're getting into and have it done by our June town meeting. Did we not make a commitment to writing in an MWRA that we would do this before April 30th? No, that was a, no. We we determined that date for ourselves to come to some sort of a conclusion. We didn't make a commitment. Again, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I'll state it again. The MWRA and, and the town of Reading have been terrific as far as, uh, you know, working with us and offering us an opportunity to tie into them. Again, they were up until a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, less than a year and a half ago, they were our only option. And they were very forthright, uh, straightforward, and uh, as we assured Mr. Lasky and uh, the head of the advisory board, you know, we weren't looking for, for them to negotiate against themselves or against the town of Andover or alter any terms and conditions which they had already offered us. We thought they were very fair. And uh, I believe that position still stands, you know, and they reluctantly understood, and might not be, they may be a little bit disappointed with us, but they also understood that we had a fiduciary responsibility to take a look at this option. Um, so, sorry. I just had another question on that. Um, and now I understand all the times when we've talked about SUA why you mentioned the cost prohibitiveness of it based on the slide that you showed. But is in terms of the negotiation, I have extracted that. I've extracted the consideration of sewer as a part of this in terms of either or you know with that not re being a real possibility here um, it looks as though there has been some consideration at least by the expert but what in terms of the negotiations has led anyone to believe that that's going to happen with Andover uh, because it looks like that graph that was Produced seems to suggest that there's a foot in the door for that to happen. There, there is a foot in the door, and then that was part of the, the carrot that they held out to us was that, you know, you buy water from us, we'll work with you to assist you in joining the Greater Lawrence Sewer. Uh, they have a seat at that table. They have a representative, voting representative, and they would be advocating for our joining. Uh, the important, one of the other important pieces of information that's important to note is that. The line that goes from Andover through Lawrence, Andover actually owns the line that goes through Lawrence. So there wouldn't be, have to be any additional permitting through Lawrence. Uh, so get, get in terms of that, would, just like we have to pay a wheeling fee for Reading, would we be doing something of that nature we through be, Andover? For sewerage, yes. Yeah. For wastewater, there would be a, there would be a wheeling uh, charge. And there would be yeah. an upgrade, you know, to their pumping station to intercept an order, set it up to the treatment plant. But yeah, there would be a, a wheeling charge. Again, it's not a money maker for Andover at all, by all means. Uh, it was not a consideration. For them, it doesn't make any difference. It, it, there's no benefit to the town of Andover by allowing us to go through there, uh, even with a wheel, small wheeling charge, uh, to allow us to go through. They knew that we were looking for an opportunity to meet our wastewater needs here in North Reading for both an economic development and public health standpoint. They were aware of our discussions over the last several years, and they, they would be willing to partner with us and assist us in 
uh, getting us to tie in and be supportive of getting society to great, greater Lawrence. Again, the opportunity for that, again, allows us over a long period of time to phase it in. Mr. It doesn't have to be done all once, obviously. Please, and, Mr. And we did, we did pay a visit to the Greater Lawrence Sewer District, and uh, I think we left there with the understanding they're at about 50% of capacity, and they'd like to have some more customers to pay for their capital, just like Andover would like to have some more water. Yeah, they were very receptive, and again, I wasn't able to make the regional meeting, but the chairman went uh, with Mr. Masseri and the town administrator with the state, and they just said, make up which, your mind which way you want to go. Hold on. Mr. Schultz, please. A question actually for our water experts. I, I see tons of articles in the papers about every time there's a large storm, there's a ton of raw sewage that's dumped <coughs> into the Merrimack. Uh, I also see stories about all these syringes washing up on shore. You know, the, the papers are littered with these stories. I know the Quabbin obviously has no industry on it, the Merrimack does. What about the water quality? That's a real concern of mine is the amount of raw sewage that gets dumped in there on storm overflows. What are your, th I mean, where does, well, first of all, where does Lawrence discharge? Into the Merrimack? Into the Merrimack, but they're south of where the withdrawal, Andover's withdrawal is. Where does Lowell discharge? Above. And we're drinking Lowell's discharge. 60% of it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's well, just think we'll, about that when we look at price. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we, let, me, let me add to that. We, we yeah. talked to um, North, uh, we talked to Andover about this and what their procedures and processes are. They're in communication with every community upstream that has C CSOs, they're called, combined sewer overflows. Um, they do not happen very often. Um, they are notified when they happen and they shut down their, with their intake when they do happen. Um, the good thing about a river system is um, you get almost instantaneous dilution and it flows by, you know, any waste is dumped, is, it flows by fairly quickly. Is um, there any chance of that happening in the Quabbin? Uh, on the lines where it comes in? Nothing gets discharged into that water source. No, no, because they have the yeah. water ship so have discharged at the Quabbin. Yeah, that's a, that, and that's a real concern of mine, I think, that we're overlooking. I think for years in North Britain, we've just picked the cheapest option for everything. And NWA costs more. The other thing that scares me is sewer collaboration. I don't know what that means with Andover. I mean, we saw what it's like for the last five, seven years negotiating with Andover to even get to the point where we're at today. I mean, they haven't been the most cooperative. I mean, the current board is great, but boards change every year. The last board was a lot different than the new board. The next board may be different. I don't see how once they get us locked in with a 99-year agreement, they have any incentive to cooperate with us on sewage. So I, to me, that could be a red herring that we're looking at. I just, I don't know. I don't want to waste everybody's time pushing towards the Andover. I just think and I is a more modern source, a cleaner source. It's better quality drinking water for our citizens. And I think, you know, mark my words, we won't be here so I can say this, I can predict it, but in the year 2117, people are going to look back and say, well, oh, for 14 million, they could have went with the NWRA. Now we got to try to re-up on Andover. And it's not permanent. I mean, it's long term, but it's not permanent. I, I, we can't just always take the cheapest option out. That's not always the best option. Just my thoughts on it. Um, Mr. Yu, if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm surprised. I, I didn't expect to have a, this many questions, and I apologize for that. But um, if we are not able to negotiate a final agreement with uh, Ando or come to any type of resolution going forward, and we decide to go the MWRA route. With Reading not having town approval and not doing so until November, would we not be vulnerable to the same issues that we had with Andover in their first meeting and eventually we were able to work, they were able to work it out? But wouldn't we be vulnerable to a very bad situation having no water intake available to us? Mr. O'Leary. I, no, I, I see the issues as very different. Uh, and again, as far as you know, Reading's approval, you know, part of it is for home rule petitions. And the other is for, uh, uh, first of all, for the interbasin transfer, and the other is also for conservation land in the crossing of um, Ipswich River at Mill Street. 
uh, very different uh, issues in relation to that. The rest of it is just, you know, Reading's going to be getting a wheeling charge. We're going to be paying for all infrastructure, no cost to the, to the town of Reading at all for any of the construction. And again, uh, be some disruption for traffic for a little while, but we're even paying for the details. So, um, no, very, very, very different. Well, I know they're different, it, it, but would be vulnerable if they said, if the town of Reading at the town meeting said, no, we don't want to go go into this. Oh, or they don't want to go for the home rule petition to allow right. North Reading, I suppose. Yeah. So I suppose. That's always, a, yes. that's always a risk. A risk but but as exist. far as yep. why they would deny us that opportunity, yeah, I just thought that was, that's a scary scenario if that were to happen, that's all. It, Always a potential. Never underestimate what Tommy may or may not do. <laughs> okay, so you you made a recommendation, and uh, you look. So you're looking for a vote tonight, or are you just looking for sort of a? Yeah, I uh, think we're looking for again authorizations to continue negotiating with Andover to come to a uh, bring it to fruition by the end of May. Um, well, you know, Mr. Manipelli, you. I'm not sure how we can do that without saying yes or no to one or the other. To, well, to make the goal is to say yes or no to one or the other by, by June town meeting. Right. Why couldn't we do that tonight? What's going to happen in the next month that we don't already know? Well, I think it's important that um, yeah. we get the firm commitment from Andover as far as what the whatever minutia there is and whatever details right. need to be worked out now. Yeah, let's get the devils. Forward. Because right. it just provides the us the timeline to move forward. We need to get the same thing from the other side, too, though. We can't just get a fan. Well, here. I think this is why it's important to accept this recommendation or allow them to pull together the details, get it all locked down to the point where they Unless come the back majority here. of the board is not in favor of going, uh, are you done considering this? Right. You know, then please, you know, give us a little more time to ourselves. Mm -hmm. No, that's where I am. I mean, I... I I think in the is a cleaner water source. It's a more modern water source. And I don't think cost is everything. I think health and safety is paramount. I don't like the idea of drinking holes waste. You know, and I realize it's treated, but I also realize there's syringes, there's outflows. I, I don't, that's just my opinion, but I'm one of five. I don't know where Bill stands on this. Please. And I, I mean, I, I, I have been, and I've been pretty vocally in favor of moving forward with the MWRA. We already have the town backing to do that, and everyone that I've spoken to is asking us why we're delaying on that. So um, more, more, more of the people that I've spoken to have that expectation that we're going to be moving forward and connecting there, and I think it's, it's a better decision for the town to be part of that larger consortium with the seat at the table. Um, I also, like I just said, I extract the sewer part of it because I don't think it's a very real consideration for us. And, but it's a, <laughs> just seeing the, where it's progressed to, it's, it's tough for me, but I, but I also, I can understand where you're coming from, but I also think we've definitely told them that there's no, we shouldn't be imposed a minimum or maximum or a specific number of gallons we have to buy and things like that. So I think if, is that a real term that they're attempting to incorporate it in or is that something that? I would assume so, <laughs> you know, based upon the conversation. But, you know, what that gallonage amount is, is open, open, for, uh, open for discussion. So even though we I don't anticipate the town of North Reading agreeing to any high gallonage amount. Uh, I mean, it, it's obvious that if we go all in with Andover, we're going to have a certain. There's no doubt. That was that was the point we made. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think what it what occurred was you know during the public information sessions, I some some citizens uh, happened to bring up bring up the matter, and I think the initial reaction of some members of the board up there was absolutely it's going to be part of the deal. Um, they thought we without without, have without discussing it there. with us without uh, you know it, it, that's okay I understand that. Um, but Some it is that we get half from different sources. Like, you know, it's either all this or all yeah, that. Yeah, and again, yeah. we tried to impress upon uh, the board members up there and the public that, you know, we're all in with whichever way we're going. Um, and, but we don't really have that luxury uh, or choice. We have to make a decision as to which way we're going to go. Um, 
Anything else? No, that's it. I so mean, if, it, if it was up to me and I was voting today, I would say let's move on. We have the opportunity. We're ready to go. We, we've already gotten the town approval. Let's move on to MWRA. That, if, if it's, but I, again, I'm, I'm one of five as well. So we, you know, we really have the approval to do either one. We've, we went to last town meeting. We got the approval to do right. either. The either other process. thing is the June town meeting. You know, when we got all the appropriations, the public, our public, and we, this board, did not have all the information we have today in relation to presenting town meeting with an opportunity to choose either one. We did not. We went to town meeting with just MWRA last June. We did that's not all go. We had at the time. That's all we had yeah. at the time, other than some preliminary discussions and negotiations with Andover. You know, so. It would, uh, we were not in a position to make an informed recommendation or have enough information for town meeting to make an informed decision as to which way would you like to go. The situation has certainly changed. You know, so while we have the appropriation and we have the support of town meeting to, to do it, you know, we have a lot more information uh, right now. Right. You know, and as far as you know, uh, discounting the uh, ability to tie in to wastewater, you know, to me this, this is a long-term um, approach that we need to discuss and have to decide how we're going to do. You know, how are we going to do it? Uh, we have limited our capacity, you know, as, as Mike had pointed out, to even have wastewater treatment facilities that we build ourselves and to treat effluent because we have no place to put it. We have no disposal sites, and the single largest disposal site we had, we sold. You know, so that for us to go it alone isn't really an option other than small spotted areas. It isn't an option. MWRA has been unequivocal that, you know, you go with us, water will give you Conquer Street. There is no plan for expansion. Well, Secretary there's nothing in their, there is no, never. There is nothing in their five to 20 year capital plans for future expansion of sewers anywhere in the Commonwealth, period. That's, we sat at the table, we were told. But, but that being said, you know, to me, you know, the Greater Lawrence Sewer District is what our studies, which we paid lots of money, but told us that that's the route we need to go anyway. Um, and again, it's something that we can have the ability to phase in over time and help provide some economic development and uh, meet the public health interest needs that we have over in the Martin's Pond area. Otherwise, we've abandoned that. How do so you do it? They're just looking for a recommendation tonight the authorization, I should say, to continue these negotiations, to, right? To dot the I's and cross the T's to see where we really are with all this. I mean, to me, I don't, I don't anticipate that the deal is going to change much. No, I don't, you know, I don't need so, that. So if that's the case, you know, send us, send us forth to, to finish this thing off, then, you know, if we can get this thing done, then that's probably the way we're going. Yeah, I, well, this is what I'd like to say. You know, because I've been a fan of the MWRA approach. And I really wanted to go that way because, one, they came to the table when we needed them most. Yep. I think the quality is there. I think it is a permanent, absolutely a permanent water source, quality water source forever. And, but it's expensive. It is. It's a, and Mr. Schultz, I, you know, you make a good point about what's $14 million over 99 years. It's actually not. When you see that graph tonight, and you see as we go out and it starts to expand, when you have historically, with Andover, has been less than 2.5% increases annually. And if you talk to the other surrounding communities that have MWRA, it has roughly been close to 4%. So it's factual information, and I think you've got to take into account that separation in the two lines in addition to the $14 million think we have a, fidu a fiduciary responsibility to really, this is the path to go. Uh, I, as much as I love MWRA and I would love to go that way, you can't say no to this because the water is good. I understand the concerns you may have with what's coming in from Lawrence, from, I'm from Lowell in regards to sanitationary issues, but we're drinking that water today and I think the man that gets paid do the job has proven that we're chlorinating the water, we're testing the water. We're drinking the water. 
we're drinking the water. 60% of our water comes from there. Now, this happened when I lived in Wakefield, so. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, can I, I, and I just want to address this, you know, the, the residents of Andover are not drinking water direct out of the Merrimack River. I know we all understand that, but I don't want to leave that point. The water comes from the river, uh, as Rob mentioned, in times when there are like a week ago, we had that heavy, heavy rainstorm, and there were some combined sewer overflows into the Merrimack River. They're notified. They stop their intake at that point. So that dirty water flows down the river. When it goes past them, they turn their intake back on. They pump from there into their pond. Their pond helps dilute the, 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 the flows as well. Then they take that, and they run it through a modern water treatment plant. And that treatment plant is capable of filtering out and cleaning that water to the point where just as with MWRA, Andover has to meet federal drinking water standards for everything. They don't, they, they don't get a pass on you know, the, the number of syringes in the water or anything. They have to meet those standards on every single uh, contaminant that, M, that EPA regulates them for. So the water that comes from MWRA does meet, or from Andover and from MWRA, they're both very high quality waters by the time they get to the, the yeah. customer. The, I wouldn't be standing here recommended, yeah, let's go to let's go to Andover if I thought that was an inferior well, quality. And, and remember, Mark, too, is they're chlorinating it there and then you're chlorinating it again when it gets here. So we're taking clean water and we're chlorinating it one more time because it's going through our own pipes and we want to make sure I believe that's the the other reason why we do it, right? goes through their pipes it could get some it diminishes yeah right some diminishing <coughs> yeah, so the chlor chlorine basically <coughs> dissipates the further it gets out into the system the problem for us is we need a small chlorine residual on the very end of our system you think the the Thompson Country Club's about as far away from our sources and as far away from the Andover sources as you get by the time the water gets to us it's got a from Andover has a very low chlorine residual we need to still we need to boost it to get a chlorine residual on the end of our system. We can't have the potential for any bacterial or microbial growth in our system. So that yeah. that's really why both systems or all systems do some kind of disinfection. So to wrap this up, you know, the board took this objective on. We had a set of goals that we wanted to achieve to meet this full objective. This meets the objective 100%. So does MWRA. But if it, they both of them equally meet the objective, what's the next thing you have to go to? Well, I think you got to start looking at what's in the best interest financially. If they both equally meet the goal and the objectives that we have set. They don't. The next know. next thing comes down to the price. Yeah. If I may, Mr. Chair, I, the problem I have with two is the most desirable spot we have to sewerage is Concord Street. Uh, if we go to Andover, that's the last thing that gets done. And looking at those numbers, I don't see where that ever gets done. Oh, I do. And the if least I desirable part of, of 28 gets done first with Andover, the, the northern end of town. I just think, from so, a, well, I mean, so I don't think it's apples and apples. I think there are uh, differences. Listen, I was, yeah. I was a big proponent for Concord Street and getting it done. But when you look at those numbers and you look at this phased-in approach, for the first time ever, we truly have a path to soar. Market Street and Route 28 and potentially branch off into areas that uh, are in need uh, down the road. So we can do it. We can actually do it. Yes, the cost, nobody likes it, but if we phase it, the betters are paying for it. We have an opportunity with some of this JT Berry money that we have to... Just to clarify, the commercial betters. The commercial Not betters. the residential betters. We haven't discussed oh, no, that yet. No, yeah, we haven't. Right, so make but sure. betters are betters. Right. And the betters pay for it, and um, and I think you have a great opportunity here to achieve it a little more globally for North Reading rather than just one central location. And I'll leave you with this: talking to um, I asked Francis DeCost, who you all know, who assisted us with the low road acquisition, and I asked him if just do me a favor, drive down Concord Street, drive down Route 28, and give me your professional opinion. Do we just go lock, stock, and barrel for Concord Street and take take the advantage of this, or it, it, you know, and then look at Route 28? Is it even worth considering Route 28 at all for storage? When he went down, he said, "Mike, my true professional opinion on this is that if you look at Concord Street, is a significant amount of Concord Street that's already fully developed that is not going to change. So 
if you go and make this massive investment, let's just call it $27 million for Conquer Street, you're only going to get about 30% of those people to take advantage of that values and changing their properties. But when you look at Route 28, it's so underdeveloped that you're going to get the biggest return on that investment doing Main Street versus just Concord Street. Because Concord Street has so many significant fully developed properties. I think that's pretty powerful. It, it is. If you look at the, the previous study that everybody's been quoting, it said that there was more bang for your buck if you Route 28 than Concord Street. In the FXM again, report, the cost associated with your investment, the, problem, the investment yeah. that you have to make, but overall, once it's in and once it's done, yeah. you know the economic development that you get out of Con out of Route 28 is far greater than what you get out of Concord Street. But uh, just to go back and echo a little bit what Michael was saying here, uh, I've got I first ran for the board in 1988, and out of my platform, sewage on Concord Street, and you know one thing I learned is you just stay persistent, and he's absolutely right. This is truly uh, the first opportunity that we have had to plan long range for sewerage for something other than Concord Street. And again, our needs are not just economic development, it's public health needs too. And you know, while we were looking at the path of you know, building our own package treatment plants and we were looking at the different sites, um, yeah, that was an option that we probably were gonna have to go because Andover was out of the picture. They weren't even in the picture then. MWRA was maybe Conquer Street, nothing more. You know, what else are we going to do? We were talking about rezoning with the Planning Commission. You know, what areas could we help uh, the economic development? And how are we going to do that? And then we needed package treatment plants. Well, again, when we sold to Pulte, we gave up the largest area we had for wastewater uh, disposal. So, you know, to me, it isn't always the cost. And again, if you're talking about cost, yeah, it's going to cost more to get sewerage. But we need sewerage. We do. Yeah. We need it. You know, by the and, way. And, 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 you know, and you say if we're going to rely on, you know, you know, somebody saying, you know, never is never with the MWRA. Well, I'll tell you, since 1988, it's been never. And that was the first opportunity. In 1990, 1991, when Teradyne was going in there, you know, that took a special act of the legislature and almost an act of God to get them to be allowed to tie in there. That was all because Reading's Wells were right across the, the river. Other than that, there was nothing else. That permit goes with that property, and they own it. Yep. You know, we have to negotiate with them in order to get that ex excess capacity, which is all part of this whole permit process. Biggest tax, is that the biggest tax parcel we have in the town? Yeah. Because no, not anymore. Well, because it's a sewer. Yeah. yeah. But you know what I'm saying? It, it, it goes to show. Right. And when we negotiated yeah. with them, we talked about the class, uh, tax classification, and we said, put your buildings in North Reading because Wilmington classifies, and they get most of the parking lots. You know, so uh, I was involved in all those discussions way back when. Uh, but anyway, you know, to me, we have to look at the long-range uh, benefits to the community as to what are our needs and how can we address them most appropriately. We need water. We now have two, solu two viable solutions. You know, we need sewerage. It needs to be addressed in some form of capacity, and we don't have the capacity to do it ourselves. Right. So we never will. And again, it's not going to be done overnight, and I wouldn't even suggest we do it overnight because, again, the economics of it all, you know, doesn't make it feasible. But it does make it feasible to phase it in and get it going. And the other thing too, Steve, with this option here, uh, with the Greater Lawrence Sewer District, is the grant opportunities would be so far more available to us with that option than they will with the Concord Street. We probably won't get any grant assistance there, but I'm almost guaranteeing you we're going to get some grant assistance if we go with the large one. And during all of our discussion, you know, again, the MWRA has been terrific. They've but been again, they are absolutely. facing a you know, substantial amount of infrastructure uh, responsibilities as far as you know upgrading, meeting federal standards. They may be down the road be subject to some things that they're not subject to now. And yes, it's born through all ratepayers. But uh, again, Andover, that system up there, uh, faces far less uh, issues in relation to uh, maintaining the quality of the system and uh, how to deliver water to it. So, you know, it's not just the 4%. Yes, that's a big factor. It's a huge number. And it's something, again, all things being equal, need to consider. Uh, but the future costs, of maintaining a system, even if it's shared by 50 some odd communities or whatever it is, um, it's huge. It's huge, and that 4% grows. And uh, that's something we need to be cognizant of also. Yep. 
And the other thing, too, is, you know, I was very happy to see that the Andover voters, how educated they became from that last town meeting to this pre this recent one. Huge. <laughs> They're very educated, and they fully grasp and understand the value of having North Reading as a customer. And I think that's a big difference that's making me a lot more comfortable about making my decision that I want to go with the Andover option over the MWA option. Because that's not going to change now. And I think that's something that you should keep in mind as well. So I think we've, you know, we've gone late into the night here. And we still have more things than I would like to. If we have a motion or somebody wants to make a motion, uh, we'll take it at this point. Uh, Bob and Steve, you guys have something prepared? I don't know if we have anything right now. I don't know if we have one right we now. Did, we did not prepare a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to authorize uh, the subcommittee to continue negotiations uh, to perfect a long-term agreement with Andover. Uh, such agreement uh, to be forwarded to the our board uh, no later than May 31st. Okay, I have a motion. Second. That Jane is shaking her head, that <laughs> and I need a second. That was so second. fast. Second by Mr. Masseri. <laughs> Jane will catch that on the <laughs> rewind <laughs> on the YouTube. Okay. Is to authorize the subcommittee. Negotiating to, to the negotiating team, I'm sorry. To, to continue negotiations for a long-term permanent agreement with Andover. Such agreement to be forwarded to this board for consideration by May 31st. Or something like that. And the second was by Mr. Masseri. Okay. So any more discussion? I have a motion in the second, so discussion. None heard. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? No. You. No. I'm not voting for it next month. But do you want to take an extra month and negotiate it? Sure. Yeah. So did you vote in favor? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it was unanimous. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I didn't vote no. I heard four vote. I heard four yeses. I didn't hear five. Yeah. It's unanimous. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. June town meeting warrant. Approve it. Next. No more. <laughs> um, <coughs> I know. So, I, Mr. Chair, yes. you, so I, I don't normally ask to do this, but I have a, a verbal town administrator's report I'd like to offer the board, um, part of which relates to the fire department's overtime budget, as I'm sure some of the board members have seen the decreasing amount of available funds in the budget. And yes. something we brought up back, in, I think, in March. Um, can address that now so these gentlemen yeah, can I'd go like home? To address it so that perhaps. I'm sorry for making you wait. Can, uh, can go home. Um, you get paid by the hour, right? <laughs> no. The, uh, Do you want to come up so, to the so, uh, microphone? I'm actually going to ask the finance director to go through because she has some of the information. And then to the extent possible, you know, if there's any questions, we can prevent them. We can, present, we can address yeah, go right ahead. Them. We're not asking for any vote of the board tonight. We're more just providing you an update that says, here's where we stand. We are monitoring it. We do have options. And I'll turn it over to the finance director. Ms. Rourke. Yes. So I'm sure you've all noticed that um, you haven't been receiving weekly overtime reports sent out. And that's because we are in the process of updating the fire department's overtime spreadsheet. We are actually having it converted into an Excel document. Um, it seems like it would be an easy <coughs> process to do that, but it, it, it is not. Um, so we are working with um, an outside vendor to have that done. And, um, but in the meantime, we have been closely monitoring overtime. Um, the fire chief, myself, and the public safety director. So after a meeting in, I believe, the beginning of February, we, we briefed the board on, you know, where the fire overtime budget was going, um, you know, what we expected the revised fire department overtime budget to be, meaning hours and dollars, mm -hmm. um, what was attributed to the contract settlement, and what was attributed to some unforeseen, unexpected issues. And I'll um, have the fire chief speak to the unforeseen um, items that have um, come, come up, and then I will come back and tell you some solutions on how we can handle that. 
So in speaking of the, the unforeseen and unplanned for issues that impacted our budget um, to the tune of just about $160,000, uh, the first being, uh, unfortunately, my promotion to this position, which created a, uh, a deficit in the captain's ranks, which we had to backfill for, uh, for a period of time <coughs> from January 22nd to April 5th. Um, and that cost us approximately $25,000, $25,500. With Captain Nash's uh, retirement, that created now two vacant positions backwards with a trickle-down effect. Um, and that, that uh, cost us $61,600. Uh, we had to cover Captain Nash's position for one day. That roughly cost us $1,400. And then with some tactical and strategic group reassignments to rebalance the department to offer each group a new captain uh, the support that they need and, uh, and their success. So that restructuring cost is approximately $14,800 or $1,499. Um, the contract settlement between Local 1857 and the town uh, cost us $54,000 and then some unanticipated costs with the microwave uh, system with our radio specialist that was a plan for cost us about $2,600 to, to the date of this memo which was last week. So all told, um, exact figures from what I had was $159,881.15. You repeat one more time, one fifty-nine, eight eighty-one, fifteen. So how do we prevent people from retiring? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that uh, is a significant amount of money and unforeseen and unplanned. So back just, to you. yes, back to me with the numbers. Um, so just to note, um, in the 100 and basically, let's call it 160, because it's 159,881. Yep. So in the 160, you need to back out 54,000, which was for the contract settlement. Um, so, you know, now we're a little lower, but we're still over budget. Um, you know, if I was to send you last week's overtime spreadsheet, from the fire department, you would see that there was 8.67% budget remaining, but that is prior to the transfer in of the contract settlement because the program that they use doesn't allow for modifications. We can't update it. So really, if we add in the um, 54,000 that they're due, that would then leave about 13.34% of their overtime budget remaining. There's approximately 10 and a half weeks remaining in the fiscal year. So that trends about them being over budget by 16% if we're talking percentage wise, but you know, $100,000 approximately, give or take. You know, take the 160 less the 54, you know. Yeah. So we have some, you know, options. One is there we've done some trend analysis on his expenditure budget. There will be some expen expenses that will be turned back um, in his expenditure budget. Uh, we also have money for these type of instances in the salary pool, which we always budget for annually. We could also go to the Finance Committee for a reserve fund transfer as these overages were unforeseen um, or unplanned. Um, and we could also go to town meeting for a budget amendment. Um, we could do a 3% transfer without going to town meeting. So we have some, some solutions of how we can take care of this um, overage. What about the ambulance money? That would require an appropriation from town meeting. We would have to do that as an, a budget yep. amendment. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a reserve there, don't we? We have funds available there. Um, we just need to be careful with that um, for the reason that there will be an ambulance that will need to be purchased in the coming years. Um, and we do transfer ambulance receipt reserves every year as one of the other financing sources that we saw this evening. Um, so, you know, that would, we just need to be very cautious with that. I think it's an option we should have on the table. 
I don't like any of them, but, you know. You know, when I'm saying doing a budget amendment or a 3% transfer, it would come from another department's surplus budget that's remaining. Yeah. So we wouldn't be ask, we wouldn't be appropriating free cash for this, um, you know. And like I said, it may not come down to that. He could have some of his expenditure budget remaining. Um, but I, I do anticipate that there will be some sort of transfer needed. Through town meeting action? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily, no. But I mean, from, we have other a, avenues. From, I mean, from something other than a payroll budget, though, would be. So from his expenditure budget, nothing needs to get done. So if he has $80,000 remain, I'm just, this is not, these are fictitious numbers, but if there was $80,000 remaining in his expenditure budget, nothing, no action would need to be taken. If you know how we vote the motion at town meeting, it, it's not divided by personnel services and expenses. Right. The, the budgets are controlled internally by personnel services and expenses. We don't let you overspend an expenditure line and then say, okay, well, I'm not going to fill this vacancy and it will flow to my expenses. So we have fiscal autonomy. And, and vice versa. I don't let someone say, I'm going to hire this person at $15,000 more because I have $15,000 in my professional services. So, so we have fiscal autonomy. Yes, yes. Mr. Messier. I used to fight for that. Just the, the, <laughs> the impact of 3%. Transfers will roll into a hit on potential free cash. No. Next year. Why not? A 3% transfer comes from another department. Yes. But if that other department didn't spend the money, it would roll into free cash. Correct? Uh, true, true. But, you know, we'd have to f find a funding source somehow to cover this. So. Oh, no, no. I, you know. I understand that. I'm right. No, but, that, that. but that's. But it's a, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. I'm just making point. the point that you right. said you wouldn't go to free cash. Well, it would turn into free cash, yes, but I would not use free cash to um, That's why my I, funding source. I like the idea of using the ambulance funds. I don't know that I agree with that, um, just because we have to be very careful with the way that health insurance is going, the way that Medicare is going. And um, if we don't plan on purchasing another ambulance from the ambulance receipt reserves, and that may be an option, but uh, the trends of collections, I, I I would be a little leery about that. What does uh, we finance have the committee is what twenty five thousand dollars? I'm sorry. The finance committee has how much? The finance committee Seven. has a, you know approximately eighty thousand remaining, probably. Those rough numbers, but the salary pool is set aside for this reason annually and budgeted for annually. So again, no, no, no action required at this nope. point. Just well, again, trying to get the board informed of uh, what work's going on in the background, um, where things stand now that we've moved the funds associated with the recently settled collective bargaining agreement. Uh, we'll continue to keep you apprised. Thank you, though. I thank the Chiefs for staying this evening. Yeah, thanks for I'm thanks. sorry. We're we still not done yet. No, I'm, I'm just, Pelly just a quick oh. question, oh. though. So based on the rundown that you gave us, the itemization of what led to this, this would this is an anomaly. It's a one-time issue that there's an overage, right? Uh, I guess to the finance director I would be asking that. We're not going to see this again in next year. and No, I, I don't anticipate that. Um, the fire, unless... Right. Uh, you mean, know, we have, personnel we have some change. other, you know, personnel changes that really shake things up. Yeah. Um, the fire chief and I have, back in the beginning of February when we were revising the FY18 overtime budget to um, align with actual uses and actual hours used, um, we went through FY19 and made sure that we included everything possible and thought of everything possible um, you know so unless someone in, you know decides to retire unexpectedly you know that's out of our control um, 
or someone leaves and we're filling vacancies before we can hire someone. Those type of things are out of our control. But um, the things that we know right now and the things that we have anticipated for next fiscal year, the chief has included in his FY19 overtime budget. But you just, you know, I mean, even on the town, you know, in town hall, there's unexpected retirements that we don't know about and we don't necessarily need to fill them with overtime, but sometimes we, you know, have to hire faster, whatever it may be. So there are some of those unexpected situations. Okay. Thank you for staying for so so late. Thank you very much. Chief, thank you. Okay. Mr. So, Mr. Chairman, through you while yes. we're on the town administrator's report, if I may. Um, just a uh, friendly note to let folks know that um, curbside collection of yard waste is taking place uh, in the uh, second week of May. Uh, we had the first one on April 14th. Um, so that's a resource that's available. We're also accepting brush at the yard waste drop-off location um, through this Saturday at 4 o'clock p.m. So if you have brush, um, certainly uh, you're able to bring it down until that point in time. But right now we don't foresee a need to further extend it beyond that date, but we'll certainly monitor the condition of the town. Um, we received notification from the Attorney General's office that uh, Article 25 of last year's town meeting relative to the drone bylaw or was approved. I think I forwarded that along to the, to the board, but just to, more for the public to know, we put an ad in the paper, I think, recently, the town clerk did. So we satisfied the advertising requirements and the bylaw, as far as we understand it, is now uh, in effect. It's the mi is we call oh, that the Manupelli bylaw. Manupelli bylaw. Let's talk about this Case in law. the snow removal. <laughs> 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 oh, um, oh, <laughs> and uh, just a friendly re reminder for folks who may be uh, interested in participating. Uh, the Community Planning Commission is going to be working with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council for an update to our master plan. We have an advertisement out on the website and really are interested to get uh, a working group together, um, an advisory working group that would assist and guide in the work. Um, members would be would attend two to three meetings with the Planning Commission and MAPC staff in addition to two larger community forums. I encourage anyone who's interested to contact the uh, planning office. And that concludes my comments relative to the town administrator's report. Mr. Chairman, there's one item that we passed over uh, earlier, uh, health insurance. That is deadline sensitive. It's purely a vote at this point. I can give a brief update, and I think Mr. Schultz has the motion. Please, quick update. Um, so the quick update is that uh, we had received an initial renewal percentage um, of uh, almost 14% from Blue Cross Blue Shield in the early part of January. And through, and that was basically taking our existing plan and renewing it into next year. But because of uh, the negotiation strategy of our broker, um, IBG and Tony Mafio, um, as well as some ability to uh, utilize the performance of our participating funding arrangement, which is the partially self-funded model we instituted during um, last year's discussion with our IAC, we effectively were able to get our renewal percentage down to 6.2%, um, which is helpful from a standpoint of controlling the cost, but also relieving some of the pressure on our budget for next year. Um, certainly a welcome change from where we found ourselves a year ago when we were looking at 10 plus percentage point increases for renewal. I think the most important thing to note is in that number, there's really no change to the benefit that's being uh, afforded to our employees. And we've been able to generate that savings because of our efforts with the participating funding arrangement and the strategy employed. So uh, we have a motion for the board to approve this evening. Um, uh, Mr. Schultz, I don't know, do you need any clarification on that or? No, nope, I have it right here. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the fiscal year 2019 active employee health insurance plan option 1A as outlined in the attached document. And that was a document that was uh, referred to earlier this evening. Yes, correct. Yeah. With the 6.2 end result. Second. Correct. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. We're going to skip over the June town meeting warrant, if that's okay with you. Uh, I'll just call the board members' attention. We had a missed article that came to us from the, from the uh, Northeast Vocational School. They submitted it to us um, by in writing in October or early, uh, sorry, late September, after the deadline for the October town meeting last year. 
It is on the draft warrant now. We will be sending this draft warrant to town council for tomorrow to review. Uh, but there is an additional article. It was submitted to us in a fi timely fashion um, for June town meeting. It was simply an oversight in my office Where to are actually you add put it. it in? Um, I believe I have it somewhere along with the stable. Uh, I strike that. It's right, it's right before the first article submitted by by the Hillview Commission. So it's pretty far near the end. I want to say it's like right, right, right near the end. It can be moved until the, you know up until when the board approves. Okay. But it's a new article that wasn't on there. It was submitted in a timely fashion. We just missed it. We put the warrant together. You think we need to move it? Probably. Oh, but you two can work it out. We can work it out. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to put that back on the agenda for our next meeting because it's, uh, it's 1130 and that's going to get us to Arthur Kenny Field restrooms and concession project updates. It's purely a progress payment um, and the progress has been extensive with the uh, building now being delivered, the paving having been completed I believe Friday. Is that right? um, so uh, the building's there, there was a punch list walked through today, I have not seen the final report on that but we're very close to the building being complete. Yeah, it looks outstanding. Looks like it's been there forever. Yeah. Nicely done. So, do we have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve payment requisition number seven in the amount of $87,514 to Construction Dynamics, Inc. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Next is a routine license renewal. Um, it happens to be that the licenses expire annually on April 30th. That's why we're asking the board to take it up this, e uh, this evening for sports, spirits, and stakes pool table. Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the pool table license for sports, spirits, and stakes at 178 Main Street to expire on May 1, 2019. Second. I have a motion, a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Mr. Chair, we did skip over the, the regular minutes for April 2nd. No, we have Mrs. Minupelli had asked, right? Yeah, we passed. So we she I asked. you wanted to review these later. No? Okay. No, Good. <laughs> Not later tonight. <laughs> Not later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Not later tonight. We can't do it later tonight. Uh, let's see. We are at old and new business. And uh, why don't we start with you, Mrs. Minnipelli? <laughs> Mr. Schultz. I think we've discussed everything. Mr. Missouri. You're good, Mr. O'Leary. Just, uh, I think, snow and ice. We should be done with that. Hopefully, we're within budget. Secondly, we're brush. We're not. <laughs> we're not, uh, we're not. We are over budget uh, by, um, I looked at the finance director, is it about $40,000? Do I remember that correctly? When I say over budget, we're over the budget and the reserve and the for, next, okay. for next fiscal year. I'll tell you in one. Oh, that's okay. But but we, I'm not surprised. Last I looked, it was approximately 40, but I just saw a requisition that was entered today for about five. So, okay. you know, call it 50. Yep. We set okay. aside 200,000 from free cash. Well, I think spring is here anyway. My wife took me to walk on the beach and I get sunburned, so things are good. The Irish tan. <laughs> things are good. This is the Irish tan, yeah. Uh, secondly, just in relation to the brush, uh, I happened to participate in that process, made lots of trips myself, and had a lot of positive comments of people appreciating the opportunity to bring it down there. And maybe you want to extend it a couple more weeks, but because it really is, I, I think it's something yeah. maybe we should be offering anyway. But it's, yeah, it's a great idea. It's uh, it was good. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's I, terrific. I, I, it's one of the number one things that I've heard honestly over the past four years in terms of a service. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I frequent it as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think with the right controls, because yeah, right. of the fact of the, the possibility for abuse. Because landscape is on rolling in. Right, and, and I know that they've been checking it too because. Uh, with Chris yesterday, he said he had to try to stop a couple of people and question them. You gotta do the secret handshake with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it really, it, it, it was a terrific oh, service to the community and uh, personally, terrific service to me. I did do some burning too, but uh, okay. uh, the only other thing is the next uh, meeting is May 7th. Seven. Seven. So Before your I hope people vote. You know, go out there and vote, you know. Uh, Really, uh, participate. I think it, it, it doesn't a, matter a real shot. But, but, but you know, yeah, we have a shot a at it. Race but, but really, you know, you have people who are running you know, as, as writing candidates. Uh, there are people, you know, like ourselves, Mr. Megan Pelley, myself, who, you know, just come out and offer your support for what we've been doing for you and uh, participate. That's all. And uh, appreciate Good. the opportunity. All right. Good. Good. And uh, one thing I would like to request that we take the opportunity of town meeting to recognize Julie Comte and uh, Jerry Venezia for their time on the school committee. Especially Mr. Venezia, I believe he's been on there 20 uh, 19 years? 19 years, something like that. 
So um, I just wanted, to, we should just take an opportunity to submit a certificate of appreciation to both of them and give the town meeting an opportunity to thank them for their service. So if you could work on that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, there was just one more thing I was going to yeah. suggest. I suggested to you earlier, put a little extra money in his budget for ancillary stuff such as that. Yes. And also we have a lot of people now who are being deposed uh, and will be going to be deposed and going to court sessions. Uh, and need to be reimbursed for parking and things of that yep. nature. So maybe in the budget for July 1st, add an extra grand or something. You can work out the number. Um, yep. I know it's going to throw the bu budget out of balance, but he needs the flexibility in order to do it. And so he doesn't have to reach into his pocket to buy coffee for people too. Yeah. So, all right. We can do that. Motion. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. A motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.